This episode brought to you by How to Write Manga, your complete guide to the secrets of Japanese comic book storytelling. Available wherever fine ebooks are sold. The world has gone insane. Cosplayers rule the conventions, gamers dominate the tabletop, and the internet. Sci fi subjugates the movies. And fantasy rules the bookstore with an iron fist. Only one group can bring order to this unruly mob. A team of uber geeks, masters of the nerdly arts, trained for decades in the hobby shops and basements of the nation. Mobilized by the secret masters, they are the Department of Nerdly Affairs. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Department of Nerdly Affairs. I'm your host, Rob Patterson, here with my co-host, Don Chisholm. Up and let's go! I have no idea what that means, but it sounds awesome. And tonight, we're going to be talking about superhero TV series. We've talked about superheroes kind of before. We've talked about comic books in various forms. But this this episode, we I thought we'd specifically focus on superhero television and how superheroes, at least in the American TV world, have kind of meshed or not meshed with TV as a medium. We're going to kind of go Mm -hmm. through it decade by decade and hit some of the highlights of each decade and maybe talk about some of the lowlights as well. (laughs) Um, Oh, the 70s. (laughs) Oh, 70s? I'm thinking of the 80s. I mean, come on, Manimal, dude. Manimal. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's true. (laughs) But, um, okay, spoilers. Sorry, folks. Sorry, folks. Anyway, (laughs) <laughs> but before we do that, we should probably uh, talk about a few things. So, Don, what makes TV superheroes different from regular superheroes? Yeah, this is um, one of the complicated parts. And again, for anybody uh, listening at home, this is another one of our kind of framework episodes. So we're going to hit a few points. Uh, some stuff is going to get, it'll seem like it's glossed over because we're just trying to set up kind of an overview of how superheroes translate to television. Mm -hmm. Uh, That being, being said, even defining what a superhero is can be a little tricky. Right. Yeah, definitely. Cause, and and, and this has come up before, like what is, what isn't, I think um, effectively what you could say a superhero story uh, we've said before, it's usually about the action. Mm -hmm. It's big. It's very dramatic. Even even if you're doing like say the the Marvel store uh, the Marvel style uh, dramatic soap opera esque story, it's always big. It's not that like Peter Parker forgot to go to the prom. It's that Peter Parker's date to the prom was kidnapped by Doc Ock, who's working with like the Shi'ar to turn her into a one of their primary gamma mutants. Like it's always big. I would slightly disagree with that though. Oh, okay. Um, I, here's my pushback on that philosophy. Which is that I would say that a superhero story has to have one of two requirements, which is generally speaking, it has to have a character or a character with access to something that's superhuman usually, or Mm -hmm. a character who's engaging in activities which are superhuman in some capacity. Like they're, they're doing stuff that's not normally done. Okay. And I know that gives us a lot of leeway to work with, but... I can think of a few shows that were a little like more quieter where there weren't, you know, big epic things going on, but did involve costume characters who maybe had superpowers and such, but they weren't necessarily doing big, you know, Doc Ock fighting save the world kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So I would disagree a little bit with your uh, analysis. See, see, folks, drama, drama. Um <laughs> I think bah, that, now I'll send my minions to crush you. I mean, See, that's the, I think that there no. usually does have to be some aspect of the character trying to bring justice to the world. Okay. I think that there has to be some effort to restore order or oh, I go with order probably or, uh, restore order or bring justice as opposed uh, as opposed to, you know, just hanging around with superpowers. Like, I don't think a show where the main character has superpowers is automatically a superhero show, for example. Before before we started recording, I was mentioning there was an uh, example. There was an 80s TV series called Small Wonder, um, mm-hmm. that, which was about a family with a robot girl. It was a sitcom. Well, she has superpowers because mm-hmm. she's a robot girl. 
does it make it a superhero show? No, it doesn't, because that's not what the focus was. It was just about the wacky hijinks that you got into by having a robot girl in your family. Same with Sabrina the Teenage Witch. There, that ran for a couple years. She's got superpowers. Is it a superhero show? Again, I would say no, because she's not really doing anything to adjust society or change society with them. Whereas, if you get something, then you can get the other end of the spectrum. And this is where things get complicated, like, the, for example, The Lone Ranger, which I would argue is probably the very first TV superhero series. Um, or close to it, anyway. We can debate about that in a little bit. And... Is he a superhero? I would argue yes, because he's engaging in uh, superhero uh, acts, superhuman acts, basically. And he's better than a normal person at what he does. And he's trying to bring justice and order and change society. Hmm. I think I can synthesize our two points on this. Okay. Because I think I think you're right that what, what makes a superhero, specifically a superhero... Is that they're trying to like right or wrong. They're doing things that affect society. They're saving the day. They're fighting for justice. Mm -hmm. But they're doing it in an extraordinary, bigger than life way. Okay, I can agree with that. And I think that works like uh, when you talk about the Lone Ranger, I think that's what solidifies it. Because the idea is he's this mysterious stranger. Um, he's got the secret identity. That's part of the extraordinary mm -hmm. thing. Uh, he uses, like, he fires silver bullets, which in real life wouldn't work at all. But physics be damned. Again, it's that extraordinary thing. Right. He He's doing the same kind of heroics that a lot of the old cowboy heroes did. Mm -hmm. But there's this prevalent idea. It's not just that, you know, Shane comes in and saves the farmstead from the evil wrestler. Mm -hmm. It's the idea that the Lone Ranger is this mysterious figure that kind of blows in almost as a supernatural force, does essentially the same thing, but does it in in such, um, I guess, an unrealistic, a bigger than life kind of way mm -hmm. that it takes the idea to another level. Right. Okay, that's reasonable. I could I could buy that. I, and I think we can work with that criteria, actually, for that's what makes it a superhero show. So that actually eliminates yeah. quite a few shows, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that, that idea tends to be, um, and you'll see that when you get to, to TV shows, a lot of stories in general, that mm -hmm. when you get to, say, the 80s, you had all the action cop stories. Yep. And some of them would be, they're superhero stories, but they weren't framed off as such. Yes. And it, 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 it you get that gray area, because part of the idea of a superhero in the modern day is superheroes don't kill. Mm-hmm. And that's, again, this extraordinary idea it's at, that I can fire like a power bolt or a machine gun or run you over with my super speed motorcycle, flying car, whatever, and you don't die. Mm -hmm. Because, again, it's, it's well, it's the DC Heroes role-playing yeah. game thing. It's bashing combat. But the idea is that I'm pulling my punch or just, I don't know, my inherent goodness keeps me from slaughtering the bad guys. Whereas... Mm -hmm. You get to the cop shows, mm -hmm. the tough guy cop shows, and they're doing superheroic impossible things, right. but they're still killing people, which is mundane. Yep. And it's not framed off as as something unusual to the setting, like like superhuman to the setting. Mm -hmm. So say like, you know, you can you can shoot it like a an old school Arnie style action here and you can shoot at them with a million rounds and not one of them hits right. and that's a superpower that just doesn't happen in real life at 30 feet right but, although we're going to run into some problems with that though because if once we get to some of the modern superheroes like for example arrow arrow does kill uh -huh. bad guys that that was right. part of his shtick in his first season he literally was going along executing all the bad guys of the city that was kind of a problem for a little bit um, right. And that came back to haunt him in a big way later on. But the but you know we do encounter characters now. Eventually he stops partly because you know the superhero thing. He realizes yeah. you know maybe killing all the bad guys isn't such a great idea and it does keep them from coming back. So the producers were running out of bad guys after a while. Um, <laughs> but neither here nor there. The point is is that he he does re eventually realize that. But there are ones where they do kill the bad guys. I mean, so that's that's a modern. Uh, that's a, one of the old superhero tropes, but I'd say it's changed with time. 
Yeah, it it and and again, that was something that happened in like the fifties and the sixties, because like nineteen thirties and forties superheroes just killed everybody. Yes, they did. But but I think the the Green Arrow example to compare it to like the the tough guy eighties cop thing. Mm. Again, given the setting, he's seen as something weird because he's got like a bow. Yeah. And it it's that idea that because he's a bow and can take on fifty guys with machine guns somehow. It takes it to that kind of supernatural level yep. within the story that the characters within the story go, "Oh man, how does he do it with just like a like an arrow? What the hell?" Yeah, Ooh. That's true. Whereas the tough guy, the tough guy cop movies, these guys aren't seen as superhuman; they're seen as dicks by the other people that work with them. That's true. <laughs> that's yeah, true. and and I think I think that kind of frame when you frame it off that way, that's one way to parse through when you get to that gray area of is this a hero or not? Damn it, Kung Fu! Oh, sorry. Damn it, Kung Fury. That's the 20th time today. <laughs> See, and that's where that's, again, it's, 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 not a, it's not a superhero show, even though it's supposed to be, because right. it's, a, it's a parody of your 80s action cop film, yeah. where it goes the other way, where that crazy stuff is, uh, is mundane in the setting. Mm, yeah. That's why, again, to use Kung Fury, Hitler's the world's greatest villain. I have to kill him. But I'll have to hack time. And you can do that with a Commodore 64. Yeah, exactly. So... And a Nintendo Power Glove, dude. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Because it's so bad. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, uh. so we should probably note that TV superheroes kind of have four origins that they're coming in from at the same time. And this kind of makes things a little bit weird when they first start. So okay. we should probably go through them. So, of course... Uh, comic books, obviously. Right. So we got superheroes and the idea of superheroes coming from the comic book, but they're also coming from the pulp magazines of the day back in the 19... Right. Back in the 1930s um, and 40s, etc. We're going to have pulp mm -hmm. magazines coming in. And those have a huge influence. In fact, many of the early superheroes are literally right out of the pulps. Okay, so we've yeah. got that. Uh, and, of course, we've also got the comic strips. So, technically, that would be five. We'll count comic strips and comic books as one, really. Um, we've got the radio superhero stuff. Because yeah. the Superman radio show was, like, one of the most popular things on the air for, like, a decade. This is something most yeah. modern people don't realize that I think I mentioned in the show before. The Superman radio show was the most popular thing on, and it really had a huge influence on people's ideas of superheroes, people's ideas of Superman, all of that stuff for like at least a decade uh, in the mm -hmm. 40s and went into the 50s, if I remember right. So that so that was a big deal. Um, and then, of course, there's finally there's the serials, and by which I mean the serial films that were shown because for those who are younger and may not know this, once upon a time, when you went to the movies, you would actually be watching an average of about three to four hours worth of content that they just kind of rotated. It was kind of like proto-TV. There would be yeah. two movies. There would be a cartoon, a newsreel, which is basically like a 15-minute general news of the world type report. And then there would be a serial, which was designed to get you back there again the following week, which were these cheaply made, basically TV episode type things that were usually about 13 to 15 episodes long and mm -hmm. they were like westerns or detective stories and some of them were also superhero stories and in a way they were kind of the first television so the first movie superheroes were basically for the most part were serial characters like they were the comic book characters brought to life in through the serials although they were a little different than what you might expect yeah um, the serial car the serials were done on the cheap. And when I say on the cheap, I mean a couple guys in the back <laughs> alley kind of cheap. Yeah. Um, so, for example, the Batman serial that they did, you know, I believe there is a Robin, but they have no bat yeah, game. They is. have no Batmobile. They're just kind of – they just have the costumes, the Batman and Robin costumes sort of. And then they – yeah, then they're just kind of generic crime fighters. Like where, where yeah, are they? They have a Batmobile, but it's just a car. Like, there's nothing fancy it's about it. It's just a it. black car. That's that's it. It's not yeah. even because I no no eyes on the front or anything. No, no. And I, and I think you kind of hit upon an interesting point when you talk about superheroes on TV. Mm -hmm. 
because of all of, of those media you mentioned mm-hmm. other than newspaper strip and maybe radio mm-hmm. they're all like cheap throwaway entertainment yes, that's true and that's really important when you start getting the superheroes on television damn you 70s but yep and we should also note that superheroes kind of work best in the comics and like in that disposable cheap mostly cerebral cerebrals are not the wrong word imaginative entertainment where most of it's in your head right yeah. because they're not cheap like there is a reason why it took until like the 21st century before we actually started getting real superhero movies like ones that actually had a yeah. budget and could actually look like the comic books it wasn't because they didn't want to make them it's because they couldn't afford to in a lot of cases like it was just too expensive yeah. for them to do and this is again why it's taken so long for us to have so many superhero TV series on the same difference. They had to wait until the effects were cheap enough, among other things. And, yeah, not not just cheap, but there was a lot of things you just could not do convincing. Yeah, exactly. Um, and Lord knows the Japanese tried, but um, <laughs> but even they they had their limits. Well, that that's an interesting bit too because. Um, the Japanese did superheroes. They do them a little different. It's going to come up here because it kind of crosses into the American stuff. Mm-hmm. Because I think for television, like superheroes and the way that people think of them mm-hmm. is kind of an American thing. Yep, definitely. And you get superheroes in other countries, but they tend to be really different. Mm-hmm. And because of that, I think like superheroes on television is an American thing. Mm hmm. Japan did the same thing. Like those are the two countries where you really saw what you could classify as a superhero, and they both do them. They both do them different from each other. But keep in mind, the Japanese did get superheroes from the Americans. They didn't come up with them on their own. They're... No, they 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 didn't. But they went somewhere really different with them in a hurry. Yes, they did. Yeah, they took on their own. And that will pretty much be its own episode or episodes. I mean, we've already done an Ultraman episode, and we'll probably end up doing yeah. so, a couple of Japanese superhero episodes eventually. Um, yeah. but, and we'll mention them briefly this ep- episode. But if for those who are you know tokusatsu fans, don't worry, guys. They got their own episodes. We're, <laughs> we're going to focus mostly on the American stuff here. We'll just kind of mention the Japanese a little bit. Um, yeah, because it does, it, does, it does affect what we do here at a certain couple of points. Right. And actually, the radio stuff... And the uh, pulp stuff, and that is important to mention for another reason, which is that especially the radio one, the producers, like for example, the second real superhero series, the second one, is The Adventures of Superman, okay, which premieres yeah. in 52. The Lone Ranger appears in 49. TV, by mm-hmm. the way, officially is considered to start, as we know it, in 48. So 49, they already have a Lone Ranger TV series he, because yeah. it was so popular at that point. And... Then in 52, we get The Adventures of Superman, which, by the way, was produced and distributed by the makers of the Superman radio show. They literally yeah. took the Superman radio show and said, let's just make it a TV series. Okay, because, you know, it's been popular for a decade or so. Let's just keep going. And so that's what they did. And it's interesting. You, they're very similar to each other. The trick, of course, is that the radio show was like a 15-minute a day serial, although I think they did expand to a half hour a couple times a week later on. But... Anyway, yeah. but the Superman TV series is just like a half hour, like basically 22, 25 minute, whatever show once a week. And it's not a serial. They're all self-contained. Yeah. And that will run for a number of years. And that will be super popular in the 50s, uh, if you'll pardon the pun. Um, <laughs> and in a lot of ways, I would argue that is the true superhero show. I mean, The Lone Ranger is a superhero show, but it's primarily still a Western with superhero trappings. Yeah. Whereas the first true American superhero series is The Adventures of Superman. Which, even in the comics, the first like true American superhero was Superman. Ironic that, right? Yeah. And, and before people write in, what about Dr. Occult and all that kind of thing? It's true there were other characters because Superman doesn't just come out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. But what we would consider a superhero in like the current modern sense... That template really was Superman, and everybody drew from that for decades. Yep. That's one of the reasons superheroes have capes, because Superman had a cape, yep. and everybody went, do that, it makes money, do that. Well, Batman, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
And superheroes were super popular in the 50s again. Sorry, sorry for the puns, guys. Um, <laughs> and so as an end result, yeah, at, you know, they, but again, they weren't cheap to produce, which is one of the reasons why I think effectively Superman is the only 1950s superhero, really. I mean, there was a Flash Gordon series, but again, I don't think we were really going to consider Flash Gordon a superhero. That's more space fantasy sci-fi. Um, I think there might yeah, be there's... one or two other ones that were relatively... I don't want to call them minor, but didn't last very long. I'm sure there probably were a few other attempts. But the only one that we really remember or is considered noteworthy out of the 50s is The Adventures of Superman. Yeah, I think the Flash Gordon thing is kind of uh, kind of an interesting thing to bring up because you had a lot of Flash Gordon-style shows and you had like all your Space Cadet kind of shows that came out in the 50s. Mm-hmm. And I think what happened, because they all sort of, superheroes and, and those kind of space cateers all kind of come out of the same tradition. Right. A lot of the space shows at the time looked like superheroes. Mm-hmm. Like the uniforms would look like what in later years we'd think of as a superhero costume. Right. But the stories, yeah, they, they weren't. that The idea of the rockets and even aliens with weird abilities that given the setting was all mundane. It was like what you just ran into in the space Corps every day. Right. Actually speaking of, uh, you know, this kind of hybrid thing and that I should probably, we should probably bring up captain video and his video Rangers, which was okay. also a 1950s thing. Um, yeah. Captain video is this weird hybrid where you've got a character that's you is kind of a superhero character. Like they basically are, how, how do you describe Captain Video? What what he what he is, and this is where I say like um, superheroes and the space Gatier kind of stuff all come out of the pulp tradition, mm-hmm. and the proto heroes like Cap Captain Video is kind of he's like the the Doc Savage kind of idea, right? Like Doc Savage wasn't exactly what we'd think of as a superhero, but he was because he was a super genius and he had the weird trait that he had like the bronze skin and and he had all of these like miraculous inventions and all of his like mm-hmm. weirdo buddies had each had an ability and and it was that idea. It wasn't quite a superhero, but it kind of mm-hmm. kind of was leaning that way, right? Okay, that would that would make sense. Um... Yeah, because. Because Captain Video was basically like, it was your Space Gatier show, but the guy in charge was just that much more awesome than everybody else kind of idea. Right. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, which, of course, the, the 50s were filled with, believe it or not, science fiction TV series. There were tons yeah. of them. This, even though they had no budget whatsoever, they were still producing all these these <laughs> shows because they figured, well, models are cheap, right? So at least some of them yeah. anyway. And so they were doing, they would do all these like sci-fi TV, because again, this was the age of science fiction and people, you know, dreaming about that stuff. But I should probably mention, I thought it was worth mentioning Captain Video just kind of because he is a character of the uh, 1950s. And he's, again, he's kind of, again, like he's Flash, like Flash Gordon, a borderline TV superhero. Yeah. In a lot of ways. Um but yeah, superheroes don't really come into their own TV-wise, really, I would say, until the 1960s. Yeah, there's there's kind of a catch with that too, I think. Okay. That remember when you get to the middle of the fifties, mm-hmm. you had the uh, the the seduction of the, the innocent, House America, the Fred... House Committee on Un-American Activities. Yes, yeah, you had all of that. So superheroes kind of get relegated to kid stuff yeah, real fast. And the yeah, and, and the problem that people don't realize is that marketing worked a little differently back then. Mm-hmm. That I would produce a show and then somebody might want to, like, use my character as a sponsor for, for like, Ovaltine and somebody would want to maybe make t-shirts and you might get, like, the odd toy or that made from it. But there wasn't really a coordination between the marketing and the production. Mm-hmm. Like, that really doesn't happen until that's more of, like, a 70s, 80s thing. Right. Yeah, that's true. So you had this idea that um, because superheroes were kind of relegated to kid stuff, they weren't, they, they were culturally significant, but people didn't give them a lot of credence. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like you've been seeing now where a lot of people are talking about the infantilization of society and using the idea that, well, Batman movies are super popular. Mm-hmm. So 
it's because we're all kept in this perpetual adolescent state, blah, blah, blah. It's not necessarily true or fair, but you kind of had that in the fifties. Hmm. And then when you get to the sixties, the superhero stuff kind of takes off by accident, I think. By accident. Okay. Um, Cause I have, okay. I have a funny feeling. I know what you're going with, which was the, the, the big watershed moment for like TV superheroes. Well, I- I'm obviously going to talk about underdog in 64. Well, of course. And that's, that's the, the big thing in all of modern society is modeled after the old underdog. Cartoons. Exactly. Um, <laughs> I had the old underdog cartoons in 64. Cause that's actually, we started seeing a lot of animated superheroes in the 1960s. Yeah. The first one that I have listed here is uh, Courageous Cat and Minute Mouse, or Minute Mouse, however you're supposed to pronounce that. It's Minute Mouse. It is Minute Mouse, okay, in 1960. Yeah. And it looks like that might actually be the first animated superhero TV series, um, at least as far as Americans go. Yeah. Because even Astro Boy wouldn't come around, at least the American one wouldn't come around until 1963. Yeah. Yeah, a part of the thing is you got to remember, uh, we talked about this before, Saturday mornings and, and, and Kids Hour. Mm-hmm. You would have, um, like, yeah, typically some kind of host, and they'd show, like, cartoons in that. Mm -hmm. There were superhero cartoons before. Right. Specifically, I'm thinking of, like, the uh, the Fletcher Studio Superman stuff. Yes, there were. Yeah. And that would get shown in, in, in these, like, kid hour kind of shows. But they weren't made for television. They were kind of being recycled. I think... Yeah. I can't think of anything older than like Courageous Cat and, and Minute Mouse superhero wise, and even then, mm-hmm. it's still borrowing from the uh, the funny animal tradition. Yes, it is, and Which, I think they're really short, aren't they? They were like five or ten minutes each. Yeah, because um, they were designed to be shown during these these like like uh, kids hour shows. Yeah, that would make sense. So you'd show you'd show like a ten minute cartoon. You'd do some bits. You'd do some gags. You'd do a couple ads. You'd show another one and, and that kind of thing. Mm. That makes sense. Well, they're so they're almost uh, fill-ins. Um, here's an interesting thing: the characters were created by Bob Kane as mm. a parody of Batman and Robin, <laughs> um, and it are very campy in a way that would yeah there are five minutes each i was just double checking that you know and if you actually look at the the way it's all set up it's bit it's basically batman it's just they're yeah they're funny animal versions of batman and robin yeah so there you go there's your uh there's your weird factoid of the day about creative about uh <laughs> courageous cat and minute mouse i mean and it makes sense i mean you know they so bob kane batman was popular so they approach him and they say yeah can you make us a cartoon it's like okay yeah, and um, we see the first animated, of course, uh, Astro Boy is, of course, one of the very first Japanese imports. Yeah, I n- now mind you, Ape Man would have also come out around this time as well. Like there'd be yeah. a couple Japanese imports at this point. Yeah, there was there was Eight Man. Um, and oh, what's the other one? Of the um, Gigantor. Yeah, uh, Gigantor was a uh, Tetsujin Twenty Eight. Go. Yeah, there we go. Tetsujin Twenty Eight. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, so Iron Man Twenty Eight is there. And so they've those the Japanese superhero boom animated boom is starting at this point as well. And of course the Americans are like, well, it's cheap. We can buy them for cheap and dub them. Okay, let's do it. Yeah, and that, I think Astro Boy was actually made with NBC. Boy. Oh yeah, so so Astro Boy, yeah, it was definitely on the animated side. But I think when you were referring to uh, TV superheroes, what you were eventually leaning towards, I suspect, was probably Batman and yeah. 1966. Um, the, uh, William Dozer and Frank something, I think they were, um, Vincent yeah, that would be him. Um, and so they were the sixties Batman, which I mean, became the most popular thing on TV and kind of revitalized TV superheroes, at least the live action ones anyway. Yeah. And I mean, it was, an, and it was an accident. It was a complete accident. Why yeah, was it an accident, Don? Oh, cause what used to end up happening and this goes back. The to the Batman serial that we were we were talking about mm-hmm. in the forties, where like Robin looks like he's thirty and the Batmobile is just a car, mm-hmm. and it's 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 not an expensive production. Well, I guess Hugh Hefner used to show it at his parties. Okay, and everybody because it was like super super camp and everybody would laugh at it and that. Mm-hmm. But the guys that produced the Batman TV series watch it said, "Well, people are entertained by this." Why don't we do that? Mm. 
And that was why the uh, the Batman TV show mm-hmm. was so over the top and so campy and so overwrought because they were trying for this weird surreal feel mm-hmm. and this weird kind of kind of cheapness that made everybody laugh at the the movie serial. Right. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. That makes total sense. They could have done something much more developed back at that point, but they purposely made it very cheap and kind of funny and very cute. Yeah, and that's and that, and and it was again it was a product of the time. Right. Yeah. Cuz this this was like the mid 60s. If I remember right, Batman was the show that killed the monsters as well. We talked about that before. Where, yeah. When Bat when the monsters was like the popular camp hip funny show and then suddenly batman came along and the monsters was just dead yeah yeah grandpa already was but sure yeah um, well there's that too <laughs> um, but no grandpa li- grandpa he died a couple years ago that that guy lived forever he really <laughs> did <laughs> i think he outlived most of the rest of the cast mm-hmm. that's that's one of those bizarre things al al lewis if i remember right he yeah died a couple years ago and the rest of them like you know, Herman died back in like the 90s, I think it was. Fred Green, yeah. like either the 90s or early 2000s. So anyway, and Batman was so popular, of course, there was also a Green Hornet TV series that they brought back to try to uh, capitalize on that popularity. Yeah. Which is noteworthy for having an incredibly bland lead and Bruce Lee playing the sidekick. Yeah, because that was, they do a crossover with uh, the Batman TV show and that was one of the... Uh... One of the problems was that Bruce Lee was really upset with the idea that this guy who obviously couldn't fight Robin yeah. kicked his ass in the show. And he's like, how does that happen? This guy <laughs> exactly. can't fight. You know? This guy can't fight. What? Yeah, and there, oh, there's a whole like legend about that. But the short version is, is that, no, there was really no fight between him and Burt Ward or anything like that. It just yeah. really, it just, it just, he wasn't happy about the whole thing. Yeah. I think he did arrange it, though, so it does come across as a tie. That's partly Bruce Lee's idea. That was yeah. just to kind of assuage his ego. It's like, okay, it's just a tie. Because, mm-hmm. um, yeah, that's why everyone was watching The Green Horn. At first, those who did only lasted the season was because, yeah, Bruce Lee was just amazing to watch zipping around on the screen, just kicking <laughs> everyone's ass. Yeah. And it worked out because the Green Hornet, of course, is not supposed to be a very dynamic character himself. He's mostly just stand there with his weird gas gun and, like, gas people, I guess, kind of. Yeah, I was never kinda. a Green Hornet fan, so... Hmm. <laughs> that works but that was the thing and then when the batman tv show takes off yep um what ends up happening is for most people that becomes what a superhero is not exactly i would argue yeah, there's, it becomes there's, a lot for live action superheroes i would agree but okay continue sorry well because you're kind of right because a few years prior to that you had marvel putting out their comics yes i, was, I want to bring that up and so the year after Batman debuted, the Marvel comics, if you want to call them animated shows, Marvel superheroes popped up, mm-hmm. uh, which is 65 episodes, according to my notes here, of, uh, well, basically they're the comics with people's mouths superimposed <laughs> over the characters and some kind of pseudo movement. There they're really are motionless comics, basically. They're motion yeah. comics. They're not really, but they're literally the superhero comics. That's pretty much what they are. Yeah. With, with actors reading them and weird effects. And, and the, like the most mm-hmm. catchy theme songs in the universe. Right. Yep. That's true. And they also had when Captain America raises mighty shield. <laughs> throws. Throws, throws. Sorry, throws his mighty shield. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. And that uh, song will stick in your head for the rest of your yeah, life. Yeah, if I were to sing the whole thing, even with my horrible <laughs> rendition, it would still stick in your darn head. And there was a Fantastic Four series. This is 67. There was also the yeah. Superman Aquaman event, Adventure Hour. Yeah, those those ended up being a little different because what ends up happening there, mm. you had the thing that um, because this is the Go Go Checks era for DC Comics. Yep, and DC, you can tell the Batman show takes off, so the comic books are kind of swinging more that way. Mm-hmm. They're not a hundred percent sure what to do with them because up until then, comic books were generally considered kid stuff, right? DC kind of hung on to that attitude a little longer. Marvel comes out in 62. Marvel does their, their, that's where you get like the overwrought dramatic. Um, there's some dark to these heroes. There's actual consequence. They skew a little higher age group. 
Well, actually, mm-hmm. they skew a lot skew a lot higher than what people thought at the time because yeah. this was the era where it'd be like late teens, early like college students that were the biggest fans. Right. Yeah. But you had the Batman TV show come out, and then you get these kind of two opposing images of what a superhero is happening in 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 the public. Yep. True. Um, the, and don't forget Hanna Barbera, which of course brought out um, was it Birdman and the Galaxy Trio. Oh, they and had also, tons. And their space ghost is also from this period. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's then there's uh, the Super Six as well. Yeah. I mean, there's Super a lot Six, of them. Although the Super Six, I don't think was Hanna Barbera. I think oh. that was uh, uh, I can't remember the name. Can't remember the name. It's one of the the, the Patty Frilling, was it? Okay, yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, Patty Frilling what, would be right. Yeah. Because you can see what the cartoon stuff... Now, the cartoon stuff is being aimed at kids, like the Saturday morning shows, because Saturday morning is now a thing. Right, yeah. And even then, you're getting this kind of weird back and forth, because the the Batman TV show is prominent in people's minds, because it's television. It's, it's yeah, exactly, the most, yeah. most prevalent. And for the comics, the Marvel thing is definitely a presence. Mm-hmm. Even then, Marvel, because this becomes like the uh, the Marvel pop art period... They call it, which is just was a marketing thing because again they were trying to capitalize on this whole Batman thing too. Yeah, of course, because right. when you yeah, and and when you look at the cartoons, you're getting the weird ones like um, the Superman Aquaman Hour. Um, again, it's 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 a little more kiddied. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think they did like a Teen Titans one back in this time. You're coming up to like the Super Friends. Yep. In a few well, years, that will be that'll be in the seventies, but yeah. But it's only a few years away. And and, and this is all like the kitty stuff. You've got the Marvel stuff mm-hmm. where you've got like the superhero hour. You've got the Fantastic Four cartoon that are literally coming out of the comics. Mm-hmm. And they look different. They they like they look dark. Remember, you've got like the Spider-Man one comes out of this era too. I think so. But you mean the Ralph Bakshi Spider-Man? Yeah, except it wasn't Bakshi was the guy directing. It was another. I forget the company it put it out. It was the same guys who did uh, did uh, Rocket Robin Hood. Yes, it was, and they were Canadian Toronto company. I'll look them up while you're talking. Keep going. Yeah, but that was the idea. So you've got this other idea where there's still kids shows, but they're they're still now they're looking at some consequence. There's some heaviness, mm-hmm. like like um, as I recall, people die in like the Marvel stuff because it's coming out of the comics. Right. The, the villains are, I will steal your homework and turn your parents into chickens. <laughs> it's not that at all. Well, they were actually on the Spider-Man TV series anyway. Which well, yes. Which in 67, just for okay. reference. And yes. It, mm-hmm, and it was oh. by uh, Gantre Lawrence Animation Creative yeah. Films. You know? And by the way, Ralph Bakshi is credited with one of the creators of it. He would help set the whole thing up. Okay, yeah, because I knew, but it wasn't, when you say Bakshi, people think, like, his production company. Right, so oh, you're right. Yeah, it wasn't his production company, but he was helping. So, yeah, Krantz Films, I guess, would be the main, well, actually, yeah. Graduate was Gant- Gantry Lawrence Animation for the first half, and then Krantz Films took over for the second season and third, whichever it yeah. was. Okay, so, yeah. so there's two companies there. I think it's the second half, the Krantz Films, I think that's the Canadian company. Yeah. If I remember right. And I think you're it was right. done in Canada anyway. Some of yeah, them. Yeah, Toronto. Yeah. Drinking time, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anytime, anytime we reference Toronto, people take a shot. Yeah. So, but yeah, and, and that's so you had those two ideas, and then you get Hanna Barbera did a lot of superhero stuff, mm-hmm. right. and they they tended to try to kind of split the difference because they did yeah, serious did. serious things, but they still had that kind of uh, DC. I don't want to say watered down or easy going, but that kind of low impact sort of thing. Mm-hmm. But they were trying to do like super, like dramatic, serious superheroes, right? Yeah, they were. Well, yeah, that they're overwrought. I mean, they're just too serious for their own good. The old uh, Hanna Barbera stuff. Yeah, and so, some of it's interesting. But they also did things too, where um, they did because they did like uh, Frankenstein Junior and the Impossibles, mm-hmm. and that again clearly comes from like the pop art, go go checks, yeah. Batman style. And there was a few, like, as I recall, um, Super Chicken is, is comedic. Um, you mentioned uh, the Super Six. The Super Six is kind of more like that underdog, cartoony, cartoony thing. Uh, this was the era of the Mighty Heroes. Yep. Yep, the Mighty Heroes, which were by Ralph Bakshi, too. Yeah, and that was, again, that was, like, strictly cartoony comedy stuff. So you've got these, like, sort of two ideas 
mm-hmm. that are bumping up against each other in 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 superhero TV. Right. Yeah. Like Batman is definitely the winner, but I think because you had the Marvel comics being so important comic book wise, mm-hmm. you can't just dismiss the serious side of it. That's true. That's true. I should I should probably make a quick note for folks who are wondering how the heck have these guys seen all this stuff? Because you know we we weren't born until like the seventies. We're not even to the point where we were born. The truth is, all of this stuff got re-aired and syndicated. For anyone who doesn't know, during the seventies and eighties. Yeah. Okay. This was all used as filler TV. So this, a lot of this stuff is still part of our childhood. Yeah. Like this stuff, especially the Hanna Barbera stuff. Pretty much all everything we're talking about here got reared to death for the next three (laughs) or four decades. Yeah. And so this is how we've seen all this stuff. It's not that we're just absolute passionate collectors of all the. Literally, we grew up on it, even though some of this stuff was like decades old when we when we were watching it. Yeah, and they would repackage it themselves because like uh, Space Ghost. Mm-hmm. would get paired up they'd chop up the old like shows and pair them because a lot of these are still being done in that five ten minute format thing yep yep, yep. so over the decades well into the 70s they just repackaged them yeah yeah so space ghost was his own thing in 68 um i think when i was a kid it was uh space ghost and frankenstein jr were paired up yep and and they weren't originally they they cut out the uh they cut out the impossibles from that because yeah. it, it 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 that kind of bat camp thing wasn't popular as yeah. much at that they would they would just keep mixing and matching and they'd be literally yeah. there no there's no new episodes here they're just literally taking the old ones and repackaging them and re-releasing them on Saturday mornings yep just as or on as filler so yep. So we're seeing all this stuff in many different forms. I mean, I remember even as a kid going, oh, this again? Because, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it just literally, oh, my God, they, they used it as filler so much. They overused it. So, yeah. so that's why we've seen all this. Even the original Supermans from the 1950s, I grew up watching them every day after school. And I grew up, and I'm talking about in the late 70s, early 80s, I'm watching this stuff as a kid. Yeah. Um, same with the original Batman. Heck, I you know as a kid, I thought Superman and Batman. I thought those shows were just you know had were just recent. Even the Supermans, mm-hmm. I kind of knew the Supermans weren't because they were black and white. Right. That that part was a bit of a giveaway. <laughs> I think the last ones might have been color. I'm not sure, but I think almost all of them are black and white. And so that was yeah. So I had that idea. But as a kid, it's like oh okay, so you know these this this is just how it is. This is Superman and this is Batman. And yeah. for a whole generation, that's the case really. <laughs> Yeah, there's there's another catch too with that when you get into the seventies. Mm-hmm. Um, well, are we ready? Can we just move on to the seventies then, or was there anything about the sixties you want to talk about more? Um, I think we kind of, I think we kind of got there. It's that idea that you've got that that uh, duality happening. Yeah, I think yeah, is important. Yeah, definitely. All right, so let's move on to the seventies then. Um, now seventy three, of course, is Super Friends. Yeah. God which help is a weird mix mash of the two as of what you're talking about, and again, animated series about. You know, about the Justice League. It's a Justice League animated series. It's as close as they could get, especially considering they had, like, the PTA breathing down their necks. So it's literally a superhero series with no violence. Yeah. And no consequences and just lots of tackling villains and, you know, noble heroes doing hero and villain stuff, kind of. Yeah, if if you remember the first few seasons, you really didn't see many villains. You'd be like, oh, no, that volcano just suddenly popped up that's, next to the summer true. camp. You know? Yeah, that's true. They did a lot of that stuff, yeah. Mm. And, well, again, because they couldn't have them actually fight anyone. Yeah. So, yeah. That, so that was a bit <laughs> of a problem. Um, mind you, there had... I mean, there had been Superman and Batman series and such before. I mean, even the Avengers actually was part of the Marvel superheroes a block. Mm-hmm. But... Um, but again, there are only a couple episodes because that's, you know, they just took a couple issues of the comic, right? But yeah. Super Friends was the first truly animated, I, I can't say superhero team series. There had been a couple team shows before, but it was the first attempt at Justice League basically animated, I think. Yeah. Um, and it was actually very popular. It was super popular, in fact. Yeah, there, there's a catch when you get into this time period. Mm-hmm. What's happening is the same kind of thing that's happening, like, nowadays. Mm-hmm. That superheroes were incredibly popular as characters and properties and licenses Mm -hmm. but the comic books themselves weren't selling yeah that's true like that that 
And I think what you end up getting, um, yes, because you start getting different permutations of the characters appearing in in like TV shows and that, right? And I think it's because, because for the longest time, even coming into this era, era, the comic books were separate from all of the merchandising, right? Like Marvel Comics didn't coordinate with uh, the companies producing toys or T-shirts or that all that much. Nope. There's there's a famous story that um, when Mego did uh, the, their superhero figures, mm-hmm. they wanted accessories. So at one point they give Spider Man a car. Yeah, yeah. And that's not from the comic or that, but they did an issue of the Spider Man comic where this marketing team wants to give Spider Man a car. And remember, Peter Parker at this time is only like 16. He doesn't have a driver's license. Yeah. So he's lumbering around in this hideous vehicle that, as I recall, he drives off a pier accidentally, at the end, and that's the end of it. Yeah, yeah. So you didn't get, when you get, like you said, the Super Friends is the Justice League, mm-hmm. but they can't call it that. They don't really borrow from the Justice League, like, history or anything. No. Um, the first season, they added a Wendy Marvin and Wonder Dog, who are, like, the the kid sidekicks that they come out of nowhere. yeah. Like, who the hell are these kids? They're not in the comic. And nobody really cared because if you were into the comic, you might not care about, like, the shows. If you're into the shows, you might not even know there was a comic. Yeah. And it's the same kind of thing you get nowadays where I think um, Mm -hmm. the comics aren't popular, even though the parent company usually has a lot of say in both. Right. The parent company is kind of ignoring the comics, and that's why you'll get, like, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Mm, that's true. Which is it's a separate continuity from the characters in the comics, and nobody who makes any of it cares. Nope, nope, not at all. And that's probably a good thing. In the, in that case, it's definitely a good thing. It can it because it's it's a different medium and it's a different mindset. And again, yep. this 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 is what we're we're getting into into the seventies. Yep. Also, the seventies, we're going to actually start getting some real live action superheroes again, sort of. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, no, we do because in seventy four, uh, we get Shazam. Mm-hmm. Which will last for three seasons and actually be quite popular. It was Filmation's, I think, first or one of their first ventures into live action. Um, and is literally, it's the Captain Marvel. It's, you know, Shazam. You know, I say Shazam, yeah. I turn into Captain, you know, Billy Batson turns into Captain Marvel. That's what it is. It's a live action series about him traveling around in a motor home um, with an <laughs> old guy. Yeah. Um, and the two of them have their cross country adventures. And, um, you know, you know, the dam breaks and other stuff happens and, you know, Billy transforms into Shazam and goes and, you know, and, you know, saves the kids that are about to be crushed by the dam or things like that. Right. It's super cheap. Like, it's literally on the level, if I remember right, as a kid, it's been a while, it's on the level of the old Republic serials, basically. Yeah, in in, in color with camera angles, but yeah, you're basically right. But it was super popular. In fact, it was so popular, they did an ISIS series to go along with it. Yeah, and and that's another one of them things that Isis was a character they made up to yeah. do a live action. Although she got picked up, DC did do a comic book. Yeah, and in fact, DC ended up with, I think, the semi-rights to her or whatever. Because she's popped up in DC a number of times over the years. Yeah. Usually yeah. not for very long, but she does pop up from time to time. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that's it was, so, it was popular enough that they did spinoffs and such. I mean, which is awesome. I, uh, and so this is, of course, is for Saturday morning, mind you. This is yeah. still meant to be Saturday morning material. Yeah. But it, again, it, it shows that idea that superheroes and the idea of superheroes were popular. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they were. Well, Americans love their superheroes. They just come in different ways. Um, yeah. And there was the same year, 1975, we also got what could be... Oh, sorry. So it was 74. I apologize. Mm-hmm. Uh, we could, we got the six million dollar man. Yeah, which I would also argue is a superhero series. Now this goes yeah. back to what I was saying at the beginning. He doesn't have a mask. He doesn't have any of the um, weird, uh, well, yeah, weird superpowers because they're from his bionics. Basically, mm-hmm. you know, he's the bionic man. He's you know he cra- He's an astronaut who crashes, and they rebuild him with like a mechanical arm and mechanical legs and a mechanical ear and eye, and so. He basically ends up being yeah he's a superhero basically he just but he has yeah. no costume or anything. Well, he he it even then though there's a lot of episodes that he's sent undercover. Yes, that's true. And it's it's 
the Six Million Dollar Man kind of bridges a bunch of different because it's science fiction. Mm-hmm. Um, it's spy because remember we're just coming out of the super spy era. Yep, that's true. And that kind of is another one of those weird gray areas that it sort of it it bumps up against the superhero thing. Yep. And yeah, the Six Million Dollar Man I would probably say too is straight up superhero. I would definitely agree. I would yeah. think that I would say the super Six Million Dollar Man. It does start more of a spy. Like if you see the original TV movies, it is mm-hmm. basically just you know enhanced spy. It's like a spy with extra gadgets. But very yeah. quickly, the TV series becomes um, superhero. Yeah, because super villains. Sorry. Yeah, because it's it's the book it's based on was was a little closer to the the spy thing than the yeah. show was. Yep. And it it does because that's you you've hit it one of the big problems too with uh, that you're starting to see with the superhero TV shows. Mm-hmm. That they can't really do super villains. Yes, yeah, we should talk about that. Why can't they do super villains, Don? Oh, well, the big thing is because, like, if you're doing a serious show, it's expensive. Mm-hmm. Like, well, really expensive. <laughs> that, and let's face it, we're still in an era where to do a superhero costume does not look that good. Really, I mean, it they, depends. They, they're having a real. I know it depends, but the. But really, they're having trouble doing superhero costumes and getting people to buy a superhero costume, period. And then to ask them to do super villains as well. I mean, they made it work with Batman because Batman. But yeah. To, but for the $6 million man, he has super villains, but they don't mm-hmm. look like that. And they're also very expensive to do. Mm-hmm. So he's got like, uh, there's a lot of times that like evil android characters pop up. Which yeah. Which look like a normal human until he punches them and then their face falls off and... Then you can see that they're oh my god they were a robot underneath yeah <laughs> and if i remember right he's got there's a mars probe thing i remember venus from probe oh, okay venus probe which yeah. is basically a dalek um, oh, it's a huge dalek though it's a freaking huge dalek that um keeps going crazy and he has to stop it from time to time yeah and, that's that's one of the bestest episodes of anything ever is the ones where he's fighting the venus probe I remember when I was a kid, the Venus Probe episode scared the hell out of me as a kid. I'm like, oh my god, how's he going to beat that thing? Because <laughs> so, they were awesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I, I guess it's actually a little closer to the mechanoids, though. Are they called the mechanoids? You know, the original, there's the, there's the Daleks and there's their rivals, which are like, they look they look like They're, balls with yeah, um, stuff with, sticking out. Well, yeah, and they got pinchers. Yeah, they got pinchers, they yeah. big pinchers. Yeah, it's, it's kind of, because the, with the Venus Probe, if I remember correctly... And I'm mm-hmm. pretty sure I do. It was like a Russian probe that was meant to go to Venus and right. take samples. But the rocket crashes and it's on Earth and it's trying to defend itself. Yeah. And that's why it's wrecking stuff and Steve has to go out and like kick his ass and he picks up the crane and all that. and Because it, it busts his arm. I remember the, it's got a claw that snaps like his bionic arm at one point. And... Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, that's pretty good. He kept he fought a couple times. He fought the fembots. Of course, which are exactly what you might think. They're 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 these evil scientists create, keep creating these like female robot warriors, basically. Well, people have seen Austin Powers, so yeah, okay, that's where yeah. it comes from. That's where it comes from. Yeah, exactly. And um, which he can't really hurt them until somehow their faces get knocked off. Then he beat the <laughs> crap out of them. Yeah, because he can't be shown actually beating a woman up. So yeah, to, so they have to something has to happen so that their faceplate falls off, and then once they're an evil <laughs> robot, then he can just start beating on them. It's kind right. of funny, actually. And then he fights Bigfoot. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. I can't forget Bigfoot. It was who, if I remember, was controlled or made by aliens. I, I what which wasn't it? I, if I remember that one, wasn't there two? That there was an there was an evil Bigfoot that the aliens had turned into a into a cyborg and were controlling. Right. And then I think there's like a another episode where he finds like there's a good Bigfoot. Okay, there's it's an actual Bigfoot instead of like the alien thing. Yeah, that may actually I think you're right because Bigfoot was super popular, so he pops up at least two or three times during the series. Yeah, they made a toy of him. So yeah, right. And oh, and he also popped up in the Bionic Woman, but that's also part of Return of Bigfoot. Okay, so yeah. and, the, and the Bionic Man, of course, was so popular that they did a, a sequel spinoff series called the Bionic Woman as well. Yeah, they kind of did one and a half sequel spinoff series. What do you mean? Uh, cause if I remember correctly, uh, during, in the Bionic Woman, they introduced Max. Right? Oh, yeah. The, the Bionic Dog. And I think, yep. I remember somewhere that was going to be, they were thinking of doing another spinoff, but it wasn't, wasn't quite popular enough. Right. Well, 
there, there's a fun fact. The Bionic Woman actually, she first appeared on the Bionic Man, and she dies. Yeah. She actually dies during, at the end of her first appearance. But she was so darn popular, and everyone loved Lindsay Wagner in the role so much, they actually said, no, 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 she was just uh, you know, sleeping, or her, her <laughs> death was faked or something, whatever, for whatever reason. And so they actually, yeah, they bring her back for the Bionic Woman TV series, and eventually right. Steve's shocked to discover, oh, wait, she's still alive. Mm-hmm. Um. And it's it's also interesting because Bionic Woman ended up being on a competing network. So at one point, the Bionic Man and Bionic Woman were literally competing with each other for ratings. Huh. huh. So, yeah, I don't know how that worked how, how it was so well, but it was quite popular. I remember yeah. reading, actually, the Bionic Woman. People asked, why does the Bionic Woman never punch anyone? And, mm-hmm. the, I, and they asked the director this, just a weird aside. It goes back to one of your points from earlier. And they said, because if she punched anyone, she'd kill them. Yeah. So if you actually watch the whole series, she just pushes people. You'll see her constantly pushing people away or pushing things away or knocking things over or such because yeah. she's trying to avoid hurting people. And if I remember the $6 million man, that was a little bit of the philosophy too. Well, which is, yeah, they're they powerful enough. They could kill people if they wanted to, but they're trying not to. Yeah, plus it's it's hard to film a fight like that. Yeah. And that's why the fight scenes would be like they'd stare at each other you know, pat each other on the shoulder and then like Steve would throw them out a window. Yeah. Cause it was, it was just easier. And that was also one of the things that you start seeing to represent them doing like superhuman bionic stuff, which they couldn't convincingly. Not really. Yeah. What they used to do is you'd have the sound effect and everything would be slow motion. Yeah. Slow motion. Which here's your weird bit of trivia. Cause I was actually just a few months ago. I happened to be forever in the mood. I went on YouTube and was watching some old Bionic Man episodes. Okay. And there, the first couple episodes of the Bionic Man doesn't have that sound effect. It's not there. The first time you hear it, it's actually used by, he goes up against, it's his first Android that he encounters. It's actually a copy of one of his friends. And he realizes that this friend has actually been replaced by an android and they have a big fight at the end because it's sent to kill Steve. And it, whenever it does something, you hear that sound effect. Right. You hear those sound effects for the android. And they, I guess they like the effects so much after that, they use them for Steve. Mm-hmm. But the first time, that's the first time you hear it, it's the android that's using that bionic effect, not Steve. Oh, Okay. It took them a little while to cotton on to that. Say, like, hey, this works really well. We should do this for our hero. Yeah, because that was that too was the idea that um, they didn't have too much precedent to go off of once they started doing serious live action superhero stuff. That's true. They were kind of winging it. Yeah, because mm-hmm. but oh, it no, goes go both ahead. ways though. Let, let me let me point something out though. Because they didn't have any precedent, they also could do whatever they wanted. Yeah. And so it gave them a lot of freedom in what they did as well. And that's something you could argue that some later superheroes would, wouldn't would have. Um, we should also note, uh, I'm sorry to go on uh, just for time, I just want to go on. We should also note that 76, shortly after uh, Bionic Woman hits, we also get Wonder Woman as well. Yeah. The, the Linda Carter Wonder Woman series, which was, again, super popular when it came out. Everyone loved Wonder Woman. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's another interesting one where Wonder Woman originally starts in World War II. The whole first season is a World War II set. It's almost like they're trying to be, do the campy Batman thing a little bit, but right. they're also still being fairly serious and straightforward with it. Yeah. And then the second season is where they jump to modern day and suddenly she's a secret agent working in the mo- in the modern era. Yeah, there's, there's a couple catches with that too. Mm-hmm. Because you had the 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 thing. I think this is also just after the um, the mm-hmm. the comic when she gave up her powers and was a spy because everybody did that in the late sixties. Spy martial artist. Yep. And they might have wanted to glom onto that a bit. Maybe and, they did. Yeah. And okay. part part of it too is the World War Two thing gets expensive because you need set pieces. Yes, you do. Yeah. Because. Because one of the things relating to your idea of um, mm-hmm. they could do anything because they didn't they didn't have precedent. If you look at these first three big like superhero live action TV shows, mm-hmm. each one of them does something mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. that becomes very iconic because you mentioned the the six million dollar man the slow motion woo, 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 woo. yeah exactly yeah that that instantly makes you think of the six million dollar man oh yeah when they did Batman for the fight scenes, they used comic book sound effects. So Batman punched somebody, and then you just see, like, the big pow on the screen. Mm-hmm. And if you remember Wonder Woman, they used to frame off the transitions between scenes as comic book panels. Yes, yeah. I remember that. And these were interesting because, again, those became very iconic. That that was, that was something that put you in mind of those specific shows. Right. Yeah, that's true. They're all very iconic. Actually, I'll tell you, weird, weird, weird aside... My wife loves watching Korean dramas. Okay, she uh-huh. loves watching Korean and Japanese dramas. But and so now and then I'll be wandering through, you know, getting stuff ready, and she'll be watching this stuff in the background. So, like, so saying I'm watching them is a little bit of a push. I have watched some Korean dramas. I have nothing against them. I actually enjoy some of them. But a lot of the ones she watches, I'm just not that interested in. But anyway, sometimes in the comedy ones, and this has happened more than once. They'll have some character doing something, okay? And uh-huh. you'll get this slow motion shot of a character jumping over something, and you'll get that. You'll get the Bionic <laughs> Man sound effects. Uh huh. And after seeing this a couple of times in different shows, I asked, stopped my wife and said, Do you know what that's coming from? Do you know what that means? And she's like, No, because she's from Taiwan. And, mm-hmm. so I, and so I pulled out the Bionic Man and I showed her clips from the Bionic Man. I said, This is what that's coming from. That's what they're making fun of. Except they're not really making fun of it. It's become this weird Korean TV standard that these characters, that it represents characters doing superhuman things. Yeah, because you know where they might have gotten that from? Well, the Bionic Man, but okay, where? If you remember the first Matrix movie when Neo, like, at the end is all powered up, he makes the Bionic Man noises when he's, like, jumping super far in that. It does? Yeah. I didn't remember that. Yeah, there's, like... Hmm. Yeah, it's it's really really weird. And it's, again... It's something I think people are, even like the slow motion Mm -hmm. to represent like your super speed net. I think people are familiar with it, but yeah, it became such an icon. I don't think anyone knows where that came from anymore. I think most people don't. Yeah. And yeah. And that's, what's interesting about it is that it's an amount because they had that freedom and because they didn't have those restrictions, that idea, oh, that's just stupid. They were just Mm. looking for something that looked cool or interesting. Yeah. And they didn't have a pattern to work with. So they just did it. And they thought, oh, this is cool. This works. Same with the Wonder Woman transitions. Like, this is one of the nice things and also one of the bad things, we'll get to this, that happens in the 70s, okay? Mm -hmm. The 70s is a period of experimentation with television, among other things. They suddenly have more budget. They've got, they can do different things. They got better, like the technology's getting better. The cameras are getting smaller. They can do all sorts of stuff in the 70s. And so they're trying different things. And that's really cool. But on the movie side, though, and this is where we run into the problem. I'm not sure if we ever talked about this before, where the whole idea of realism or false realism, really, starts to creep into the whole American cinema and the whole American mentality in the 70s as well. Yeah. The idea that everything has to be realistic to be cool, that anything Mm -hmm. that's not realistic is somehow stupid and campy and boring, etc. That comes about mostly during the 70s. Yeah, because of Star Wars. I would argue no. I would argue there that that predates. I mean, it's part of the New Hollywood movement, remember? Okay. The New Hollywood movement in general, which starts with uh, Bonnie and Clyde, but eventually goes to Taxi Driver, The Godfather. The idea of cinema as being a representation of, quote-unquote, realism or life, as opposed to a, an entertainment experience, right. creeps in throughout the 70s, especially in cinema. And in fact, I would, I still argue that it, among other things, I don't think Star Wars helped, but mm-hmm. I do think that um, the 70s is where we start to see the death of the suspension of disbelief. Okay. And this, I think, is really important if we're talking about superhero TV superheroes, because we'll get to this in a second, where, <laughs> the, where people stop willing to actually say, that's stupid, but I'll just accept it. Right. At least in a really obvious way. I mean, in the way, in the way that, like, superhero stories, for example... The Japanese would continue doing tons of superhero stuff from this point onward, okay? Yeah. And they're weird and they're campy and they're bizarre. Actually, I hate the word campy, but I'll use it in this case. Mm. Um, and they're bizarre and they're all over the place. And yeah, they look cheap and sometimes they look crappy, but they're entertaining as hell. Yeah. The Americans won't do that yeah, from I th- this point on. And that's part of it is that whole lack of suspension of disbelief. Yeah, I think, so. you're, I think you're right. I think what ends up happening is... Uh, Star Wars shows that you can do that with like science fiction and fantasy type stuff. Mm-hmm. That's part of it. 
and I think I think that that was why that becomes a concern for like the more nerdly stuff. And I think what happens that you're just kind of beginning to see here that you mentioned in Japan, mm. because Japan is still doing like the Ultramans, the Tokusatsus. They have the iconography in place that people can artificially suspend their disbelief. Mm. Like when you see the the guy in the rubber suit stomping on the city, it doesn't necessarily look realistic. Mm. But that imagery, that that those physics have already been instilled in your consciousness enough. You don't question it. That's just what it looks like. Right. It's like what happened here with the idea of secret identity. By now, everybody's just accepted that when Clark Kent takes off his glasses, nobody recognizes him. I. Yeah, yeah, or or vice versa, exactly. Yeah. By the, the way, I just a quick side note. I would argue actually the thing that uh, made to, made sci fi realistic was two thousand one: A Space Odyssey, more than Star Wars. That's just my personal take, though. I think you're. I think you're. You're kind of right, but I think the confounding variable is that two thousand and one mm-hmm. was meant to be realistic, like the space scenes. Oh, that's true. Whereas yeah, I can see your point. Yeah. Yeah, and and that again that's the next step but then when they did star wars they said why don't we do that level of effect Mm -hmm. but with this crazy over the top stuff and then that's where when you you meld that that's where you get the idea that people if you want to enjoy science fiction you don't have to accept like you know that the 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 fire shooting out the back or seeing the strings or that yeah which okay that's your point yeah that people gotten used to we're starting to see movie level effects. People are getting used to it and they're not going to accept less than that in some cases on TV shows. Yeah. Uh, it, and it becomes much harder to pull off. That's why even when we get to the late seventies and we get to the incredible Hulk series, mm-hmm. I would argue we're already starting to see that where the Hulk is presented. Let's face it. The incredible Hulk TV series, which starts in 77 is basically a, uh, it's the fugitive. Yeah. It's the a- fugitive starring the incredible Hulk. And even then, he's not really the 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 Hulk because in the comic, the Hulk can lift the moon and he fights alien androids and giants and mutants. And yeah, on the TV show, he like arm wrestles cattle wrestlers. And yep, um, he does actually. If I remember right, I think technically there are two superhuman opponents on the Hulk TV series. Okay, there's an evil Hulk. There's an evil Hulk, and there's an alien that shows up at one point. If I remember right. Oh, okay. I believe that there's an alien. Yeah, there's because there, there's the evil Hulk, and then I think pretty sure there's an alien. I might be wrong on that one, but I thought there was mm. an alien too, like some kind of alien monster at one point. But that's literally it. I mean, yeah. other than that, it's all cattle rustlers, all like gamblers, all whatever. Yeah. And again, it's a more quote unquote realistic Hulk, and cheap and easy. Because there's another example mm-hmm. from the same era that kind of goes the other way, right? Which was The Amazing Spider-Man. I was wondering if you are going to mention that, yeah. <laughs> oh, we have to. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true. Um, actually, we've also skipped other one one other series that we should probably mention. Have, have we? Or, oh, we'll get to that in a sec. Um, there's one other series that we should probably mention, of course. Wait a sec. Well, there's the, a the Amazing Sorry, The Amazing Spider-Man series... I guess we can mention it. It's, you know, it, <laughs> they tried to do Spider-Man, except they did Spider-Man with no budget. And yeah. the end result is kind of, and they also stuck him in Los Angeles because it was cheaper. To, you know, the place with no high buildings. Yeah. <laughs> well, so they had, it they kind had of nerfed some. him really, really fast. Yeah, it did. And it was the idea they were trying to do the comic book. Hmm. Sorry. Uh, yeah, because they still didn't have, like, super villains, but he, he would presumably stick to walls and shoot webbing that was actually, like, a rope net in that. Yep, yep. And I sometimes wonder if what ended up happening was when they got to the Incredible Hulk, they are like, nah, n- no, no, just don't even bother. It's not going to happen. Just, he's going to arm wrestle a cattle wrestler. That's what's going to happen. Well, Hulk and Spider-Man premiered the same year, so they're not really they they don't really compare with each other. They wouldn't be able to see it, as far as I know. They premiered at the same time. Okay, it still feels like that though. That the, the a the little Hulk... bit, yeah. Well, they were done by different networks and such. Yeah. Spider-Man does fight like weird ninjas. Also, the Spider-Man TV series is kind of awkward. Not only is it low power, <laughs> but it's kind of the, just the acting. Right, it's really awkward. It's just not well done. Yeah, with like thirty-five-year-old Peter Parker. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which the guy didn't do a good bad job. It's just 
No, Jeez. Nicholas Hammond did an okay. I mean, he just was, it was just not a great role. It just wasn't that well set up. Yeah, because if you want to get technical, mm -hmm. this was the second live action Spider Man on American television. When was the first, Don? That was the early 70s on the electric company. You're right. Actually, I'd forgotten about that, where Spider Man would appear, but he'd only talk in word balloons. Yeah, that that was the, the, the weird bit for that was when he talked, he made this weird <laughs> noise, and then a word balloon would pop up with what he was saying. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. that was pretty cute. Yeah, I do remember that. Because, again, Electric Company got rerun as a kid, so I remember watching yeah. it yeah, and seeing that when I was young. Yeah, that's true. Um, and, of course, also during this period, there's a Japanese Spider-Man, but that would <laughs> never be aired on American TV for many reasons. <laughs> no. And then at this time, too, you've got a – you had a little mini boom of uh, – you had cartoons going on, Saturday morning yep. cartoons with superheroes. And it was kind of a continuation of what was going on in the 60s. Mm -hmm. But you had a couple of flare-ups of um, original live-action Saturday morning cartoons. Right. Because one of the things I was going to mention when, when you said that part of the problem was you couldn't make superhero costumes look good at this time. I thought, no, Electro Woman and Dyna Girl looked fine to me. Yeah, we almost forgot to bring them up. Mm -hmm. Um Electric Woman and Diner Girl. Wow, there's a 70s, uh, <laughs> it's a young teen boy crush right there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they looked fine to me too. I can't, I can't argue with that. And the thing uh, was, they looked mm -hmm. like superheroes. Like the costumes, did, they were a little more garish than you'd see in a comic because nobody would want to have to draw all the lightning bolts and stuff thousands of times per like issue. Right. But they well, also it was done. One one little note though, it was done as a uh, Batman style show. For those who have never seen it, it's basically it's the '60s Batman just done with a pair of female superheroes. Yeah, kind of because it's it's. I might argue that they weren't exactly trying for that. That they because it's a kid show, right? Oh yeah, and they were still things were kiddied up, and it kind of gives you that weird pseudo camp thing. But they were also. It was one of the Sid and Marty Croft things, so they were still trying to be, I guess, serious, mm -hmm. but not heavy. Right. Whereas the Batman one was intentionally supposed to be kind of campy. Right. But the end effect kind of feels the same, but you sort of get there from a different direction. Right. Huh. Yeah, yeah, I could see that. It was it was cute. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was definitely very cute. Here's a weird factoid. It's been rebooted twice. Yep. Did you know that? Yep, and they were did, both terrible. And they were, did you? Why have you seen the one from from last year? Is from that? No, I saw the other one where like she's living in a trailer park now yep. and is all burned yeah, out. Yeah, that was stuff. that. There was that one, but apparently there was an actual one that came out last year. Um, I haven't seen it, but IMDb rates it uh, five point four out of ten uh, with uh, seven hundred and six reviews. Okay. Um, and so apparently it came out, and it, but it's it looks like it's a fairly straight up one. Yeah. Um. The story is about two low-profile costume heroes stepping up to the big money league. Um, but it apparently is very snappy and kind of likable and uh, just kind of fun, apparently. Okay. That's what the reviews claim anyway Well, on IMDb. Oh, I, I'll, I'll give it a look at some point, just out of curiosity. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, Electro Woman and Dino Girl was just plain fun. It's actually, you know, it looks very Japanese, actually, I would argue. <laughs> it it kind of does, but I think, again, it's because they're trying to use 1970s technology to represent these high-concept ideas. Yeah, that's true. And that's like, the, the Japanese did not shy away from crazy, like, huge idea... Like, if they're going to have, like, a giant alien, they're going to have a giant alien. It's not going to be, no, make them a cattle wrestler. They're just not going to do that. Yeah. And and the effects usually meet with varying degrees of success. Yes. Yeah, I can believe that. But they're going to make that effort. <laughs> well, they're going to try anyway. And, then, mm -hmm. and, then, and okay, I can, I can appreciate that. Yeah, Electro Woman and Diner Girl. And, again, that's one of those things, if you ever hear the song to that thing, it will be stuck in your <laughs> head for a while. It has, it has a kind of one of those catchy... It shouldn't be, but it's oddly catchy. Yeah, it's 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 if if you've ever heard of the Bay City Rollers, it's kind of that seventies esque sorta. Of. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. So, and at this point, of course, as you mentioned, there's a huge boom going on of superhero stuff in general. Uh, animated superheroes are just popping up like crazy. Yeah. We've got the third season of the Super Friends, which is Challenge of the Super Friends, which at this point uh, is turning the Super Friends is literally turned into a Justice League series, just again with pretty much no violence but it's a justice league series yeah um 
we've got a lot of weird stuff like Captain Caveman coming out. Um, yeah. You had a Fantastic Four series, and the, the second or third one, except without the Human Torch, because that might might encourage young kids to light themselves on fire, so they replace them with a robot. Actually, that's not entirely true. Oh, the the real reason they couldn't use the uh, Human Torch, right, was because the character had been licensed out for a live action series. Oh, really? It never happened, but that's the actual reason that the Human Torch wasn't in it, because somebody else had the rights. The TV rights to that character. Oh, so that's why the torch gets replaced by Herbie the robot. Oh, yeah, okay. that would make sense. Hmm. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons why you're also coming up mm-hmm. um, in another year or two, right? You get like a Spider-Man and his amazing friends. Yes, which I would argue was one of the first true serious-ish, like comic book series on the air. I mean, okay. really. Because the Spider-Man is Amazing Friends it was it was a straight up superhero series. It was animated, but it was a straight up team superhero series. And yeah, it, for my money as a kid, that was that was the first one I think I remember watching. That I'm like, this isn't comedy. This is actually straight up. Besides, obviously, the Fantastic Four. Yeah, kind of. Because again, it was really kidified, and they did the weird thing like he teams up with Iceman and Firestar and Firestar. Yeah, who who is is basically the Human Torch? Yeah. And I've 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 always wondered um, if that was because they thought to add a female character to the cast because that's what you did, mm. or if the uh, the actual torch was still uh, in limbo rights wise. I think it's more they want to add a female character. I think they want to balance things out a little bit. Yeah, I think that's the inclination. Uh, but you're right; she's a female human torch. But that's I mean, in the comics they differentiate her because she's supposed to have more like microwave powers. But yeah. She's yeah. supposed to be a female human torch. But that's another one of those things that goes back mm-hmm. to to like the, the earlier part of the decade where they were still at, they were adding stuff to the comics. Yes. That she wasn't in the she didn't Firestar didn't enter Marvel Comics until years later. That was like mid late eighties. Are you sure? I'm pretty sure Firestar actually did actually appear before then. She I don't think she's for the show. Let me hold on a sec. She wasn't. She wasn't on in the comics before the show because she. They did a. I think she makes an appearance just before her mini series because she's one of the mutants that uh, Emma Frost is trying to recruit for the Hellfire Club. Right. Oh, yep. You're right. She debuted in Spider Man: His Amazing Friends. Yeah. Yep, you're right. And then later on, she appears as a member of the Hellions and the New Warriors and everything else. There's yeah. the Firestar TV series later on. But yeah, her first continuity in continuity comic book appearance is X Men number one ninety three, which is after yeah, she's for the TV show. Yeah, right. Because that happened a few times. Because uh, DC actually mm-hmm. took Wendy Marvin and Wonder Dog and made them continuity at one point. Yes, and they've killed them many times. Yeah, because because uh, <laughs> Wendy's supposed to be like Bruce Wayne's niece. Is she? I didn't know that. Yeah, that that was that was kind of her, and she's the same idea, the same kind of like super genius detective. Right. And then Marvin was something else because uh in the comic he actually has like super strength. Right? It's it's low key, but because he's he's still like a teenager, it's it's not developed and that was why in the cartoon he was the clumsy goofball, but they explained it in the comic that it was because his physical powers were still developing, so he was still in that super awkward teen stage. Oh, I see, I see. Okay. Yeah. And then a few years ago, Wonder Dog gets possessed, I believe, by like a parademon or something from Apocalypse, and he eats both of them. Yeah, okay, sure. <laughs> Which part of me still gets a giggle out of, I'll be honest. Well, you are of that kind, yes. <laughs> I am a Gona Guy fan. <laughs> right. Okay, so we don't want this episode to be too long, so let's not wander down this trail too far. All right. All right, so let's stick with TV superheroes. So anyway, so we get, into, let's move into the eighties then. Okay. Um, so we got, so we're into the eighties now. Spider-Man's amazing friends premieres in 81. Um, and so animated superheroes, basically there'll be animated superheroes almost every year from this point on in one form or another. Yeah. And the important thing I think with that is you start seeing the animated superheroes that are based on the comics. So like more Marvel and DC comic character, I think mostly Marvel. Well, I think it's it comes in waves, right? There'll be yeah. a bunch of Marvel and DC shows, and then they'll kind of disappear for a bit, and there'll be another wave of them, and they yeah. just come and go constantly. Yeah, but the eighties you start seeing the because the seventies a lot of the superhero cartoons were something that the studio made up, right? 
which you still get, but there's they're starting to lean more towards established characters. Yeah, yeah, they're starting to lean tie-ins and established characters. Okay, I agree with that. Mm-hmm. The other thing that's going to happen in the, in the 80s that we should probably know, again, technology is improving, right? Special yeah. effects are getting cheaper. Um, they're developing new ways to do things. And the audience, of course, wants something a little different, right? Because we're seeing more high-budget movies and effects shows. So we're, we start seeing in the 80s different attempts to do superheroes. But again, going back to what I said earlier, they tend to actually be very, quote-unquote, realistic attempts to do superheroes. Yes. So they're all going to be, not all of them, but almost all of them in the 80s, are going to be shows that have a superhero element to them, but are still relatively grounded in one way or another. Yeah. Um, there are going to be a few exceptions, like, for example, uh, The Greatest American Hero, Mm-hmm. which is a story about um, a guy that comes in 81, if I remember right. And it's about a guy who's basically given a Superman suit by aliens, and he's a, he's a, just a common school teacher. And so if he wears the suit, he has basically Superman powers. Yeah. But, of course, he they the joke is they forgot to give him the instruction manual, so he doesn't really know how to use it. And also, he's <laughs> not very good at this stuff. He's just got a good heart, but he's not really cut out for this kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And so, it's kind of a action comedy kind of thing. It's almost more... It's a superhero comedy is really what it is. Yeah. But it is still a superhero show. Again, I don't think he actually ever fights any super villains or anything. He's just, again, he's doing the Hulk thing where he's beating up cattle wrestlers, basically, and gamblers. Well, and spies, because he ends up with... Uh... Uh, he's got Maxwell, a spy that he's paired with, yeah, the FBI yeah. guy, and and yeah. they they end up like dealing with spies and crooks and and that kind of thing. Yep. But the key thing for the eighties, as far as lo- superheroes goes, is there are lots of animated superheroes, but live action stuff is pretty much entirely confined to people who do not wear costumes, but just have some superhero element to them. Um, yeah. And a big part of that in the early eighties, especially, is and this I would argue it and I think Don would agree, this includes things like Knight Rider, for example, and the super vehicle shows that come out during this period. Yeah. Where the vehicle is functioning as the superpower for the character. So we've got Kit from Knight Rider, who's a super indestructible car that can go super fast and jump over stuff and mm-hmm. do has like an AI and do all this super stuff. Michael Knight himself doesn't have any powers, but he has this super powered car and it gives it's effectively gives him like superpowers. And yeah. he does superhero stories and does superhero stuff. Um, we're also going to encounter like Airwolf, same deal, except it's a helicopter. Yeah. Um, and there's, a, there was a whole bunch of them. They did a Blue Thunder one at one point. Yeah. Blue they... Thunder, Blue Thunder though, is one of those ones. I think mm-hmm. it, it's like we were saying before, it kind of swings outside of a superhero show. Cause it's still more of a cop show. And it's, it's that idea yeah. that it, it's still more grounded. Like when you talk about something like, a. Knight Rider especially, it's a superhero show because the car is weird for its setting. It's not just that it's a really advanced car. It's like impossible technology. Yeah. yeah. Um, Michael Knight is like an ex-criminal that they turn him into David Hasselhoff and give him a new identity. And he's got the mysterious past and that's another like bigger than life kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Oh no, when the, Knight Rider is 110% a superhero yeah. series. There's no question on that. I don't think anyone would argue it. Um, the other thing we start to really get into, and there were a few of these in the seventies that we kind of skipped over, Mm -hmm. uh, like man from Atlantis, for example, Yeah, we start to get a lot of series about, yeah, a guy who has psychic powers or just some slight extra human, superhuman physical abilities and who will function effectively as a superhero, but has no, uh, superhero identity or anything like that. Um, so we get Manimal, for example. Yeah. Um, where this guy has a, can, take, can have the... I know, Manimal can actually turn into animals, if I remember right. Yeah, it's it's a spy show, and he turns into animals. Um, and there's also The Powers of Matthew Starr, which is yeah. the psychic kid show. Um, there's also... What's the same as Power of Matthew Starr, which is basically the same as a Starman. Yeah. We'll get into that. Which there is based on the movie. The, which is based on the movie. But there were a couple psychic kid shows that came out during this period. You know, ten teenage boys were spontaneously developing psychic powers <laughs> left, right, and center. Except they they weren't using them to like battle evil guys. They generally were just trying to do teenage angst stuff and occasionally beat cattle rustlers. Sorry, yeah. that's just that's going to be the running joke for, <laughs> for fight gangsters or fight normal guys. But it's you know the I just it's more entertaining to say fight cattle rustlers and they all do by the way. That's yeah. not entirely a joke. There's always an episode where they fucking fight cattle rustlers. <laughs> yeah, because there's. The, a lot of them, too, get into the idea, if you remember the early 80s, like, uh, Flying Saucers and that were a big thing. Yep, yep. 
and you get because that was the greatest American hero. Aliens give him his thing. Um, the yep. Phoenix. Mm-hmm. The Phoenix was one of these like ancient astronaut guys that gets re uh, reawakened on Earth. Yep. Yep. And again, they all follow like I think because the Hulk was popular, they all kind of follow that that like man in a suitcase <laughs> formula. Yep. Yeah, and, definitely. And there was a few of the super vehicle shows because there was there was um there were also a bunch of pilots that came out because I remember the Gladiator. Oh yeah, yeah. Which was a guy who uh, his brother got killed by crook, so he becomes this like vigilante by armoring up his pickup truck. And the one thing it had was it would fling the spare tire and like spikes would come out of it. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then around this time, too, there was the uh, Puma Man. Oh, yeah. Movie, which was another, which if you've seen like the riff, like the the Mystery Science Theater one. Puma Man, he flies like a weenie. (laughs) Well, yeah, there were a ton of uh, pilots done during the early for superhero stuff, but they almost never got past the pilot stage. It's like super rare that they got past the pilot stage. Yeah, and again, I think it was because you had the problem that the expense didn't, like, that you needed really good ratings to justify the expense. And they almost never got them. Yeah, I think they tried, though, because this is the era where you really start seeing marketing become part of things. Yeah. And I think there was a lot of, like, especially the superhero stuff, they all had dreams that would come out and they'd sell toys and t-shirts and games and, and make a fortune that way. And a lot of the stuff just didn't have that appeal. That's true. Um, but back to my point, though, they generally, we were going for more realistic. I mean, there were exceptions. Um, yeah. Auto Man would be another example, yeah. which was an exception. Auto Man is kind of almost the origin of the the normal goofy cop and his super weird sidekick um, trope that you'll see occasionally. They did that with more than one 80s show. Well, not, uh, they did that before. Who, who were they doing that with before? Oh, because there was, uh, oh, what the hell was it? Somebody in Yo Yo. Oh, but that was only a pilot. You're talking about it was. where was the guy? What was it? Um... The, they were cops, and one cop was a robot. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Cause what's that, it called? Because that becomes a thing. That comes back again and again and again. Oh, what was it called? Something you're right. And Yo Yo, actually, yeah, they did a that popped up a couple times. Because there was another one in the early '80s that was the, that I think they did just a pilot or an episode or two that. It was the this android cop, and he was teamed up with with like a guy who hated like him. Holmes and Yo Yo. Holmes and Yo Yo. That's it. And then they did that like in the nineties. You had like Man and Machine, which was the exact same thing again. Oh yeah, the guy and his robot partner is a very common one. Yeah. Um, Auto Man was one of my personal favorites, though. And if you if anyone has not seen Auto Man, you should go look for it on YouTube. <laughs> Auto Man's you can find it. <laughs> the world's um, first automatic man. The world's first automatic. He's basically he's a he's a computer game character that they basically bring into the real life, and he yeah. can like. But the thing is, he can actually do things like create vehicles and do and create gadgets, and just like with Cursor, his partner. Yeah. Um, and it's 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 very entertaining. <laughs> it's very cute and very entertaining. As a kid, I loved that show. I loved it to pieces. I think it's out on disc. I think it did have an official release. Oh, I'm sure it did. Manimal, I think, did too. Um, but but yeah, I mean, Auto Man is. It's one of those things that anyone who's seen it remembers it. Yeah, yeah, kind of like World War Two, but <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> I mean, really, Auto Man's. Like, yeah, if you haven't seen Auto Man's, it's just. It, but again, it, it's goofy shit. It's good. Yeah. This is the thing, right? They're not willing to do people in costumes or any of that stuff, but they will still do some of the goofiest shit. I mean, well, they really did during the eighties. So this is where the 80s, the 80s, they're really conflicted, right? They're trying to do, quote unquote, more realistic stuff that the audience will buy. At the same time, they do a whole bunch of weird stuff as well. But it's <laughs> but it's still not weird enough. They don't really ever push it far enough. Although Auto Man came close. Yeah, well, because part of that, too, is the idea. It's, it's television. Yeah. And you don't have the budget. You don't have the technology. And you don't have the time. Yeah, that's true. Like most TV shows, you've only got a few weeks to get that episode done, so they can't really screw around too much post production. Oh, that's fair. Okay, that that's very fair. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, in '85, we'll hit Misfits of Science. <laughs> oh God, I'm not going to start singing the theme song. Don't worry. <laughs> um, although, if you go out and check out Misfits of Science theme song, you'll understand why I say that. It's once mm-hmm. it's in your head, it will never leave. It hasn't left since 1985. It's still there. <laughs> um, I, I still know it. It's the Misfits of Science. The Misfits of Science actually came up already on our show, of course. When yeah. We had uh, Will Menio on. Yeah. 
because, of course, Misfits of Science was basically the DN agents, um, Luminio's comic that they basically ripped off and yeah. their version of. They basically ripped them off. But that aside, sorry, Will, I don't know if you're listening. Um, it wasn't that bad, actually. As a, you know, as a kid, I actually kind of liked it. It's, it's an attempt to do like a live action, like kind of X Men ish show. Um, where, you know, you have a group of young people with superpowers encountering various situations that are kind of like rejected for their powers and everything. Mm -hmm. Um, it lasted a whole 16 episodes in one season, but it's again, like Automate, it's one of those shows that everyone who was around it remembers it. Yeah. It's just one of those odd things that, uh, so many, literally there were thousands of shows produced during this time, but everyone remembers Misfits of Science, even though it's considered (laughs) a dud and a failure. Well, there's a few shows from this era that people remember, but they don't remember they remember it. That's true. Because kind of tying into the pseudo-superhero vehicle thing, Mm -hmm. um, you've got the Highwaymen. Well, yeah, that's true. Which everybody remembers the truck. They remember Jocko. That was a show. I thought, like, I ate something bad, and it was a fever dream I had. That's true. Yeah, there's only, like, one season of the Highwaymen. It's only, like, six or seven episodes. So that's not a surprise. And a movie, I think. I don't know if it was one season. Um, it, It wasn't on very long. No, no, it was not very long. I remember I looked that up not too long ago. Fine, I'll go look it up. You don't um, have to. Don't do not do that to yourself. Because I remember watching it when it was on, and we all got a kick out of it, but it was because it was kind of an interesting idea. Pilot plus nine episodes. Okay, it was like an interesting thing, but it really, they couldn't pull it off for a bunch of reasons. So it, well, it ends up yeah. being mystery science theater material. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to describe it. Because it's meant to kind of be a Road Warrior-esque superhero Knight Rider TV series, but it never mm-hmm. quite works. Yeah, but the idea of a truck with a helicopter in it, that's kind of interesting. Which turns into a helicopter, basically. Sort of. It, I it mean, the front, the front cab is the helicopter, so you, it just kind of detaches and can fly off. Yeah, and the box opens up, and that's where the rest of it is, and it's really... Yeah. Which is kind of cool. I mean, that's mm-hmm. neat. I mean, it's kind of impractical, but okay, whatever. <laughs> I mean, it, it looks really cool. You watch that and go, holy shit, look at that thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then we're going to get um, into something that really important is going to happen in the late 1980s. And this goes to television, where television is changing. The mm-hmm. syndication market opens up. Yeah. Okay. So suddenly the networks are basically forced to start opening up like before the networks had a lock on tv and what you could show well suddenly we've got we start getting to the first run syndication world where these alternate companies start producing kind of like content and then they're just selling them to tv stations yeah and the networks are forced to give up some of their time so that these other companies can start moving in it's basically to encourage competition there's a whole lot there's a whole big story behind it we're not going to go into it Mm-hmm. But and this is what's going to come up. We already talked about this with, of course, Star Trek. Yeah, because Star Trek: The Next Generation came from this, where Paramount basically said, "Well, we want to create a new network now that we've got this opportunity for first-run syndication, so let's do it." But what we didn't talk about because it wasn't really relevant was there was a whole bunch of other companies and people who were rushing in to produce first-run syndicated series. Yeah, and so one of them, for example, that came out in 1988 was My Secret Identity, which was Mm -hmm. a series that some of you may or may not remember. It might might sound familiar. It started Jerry O'Connell, who went on to start a whole bunch of things later on. He was in, oh, what's that? The Show Me the Money thing uh, with Tom Cruise. Oh. I'm forgetting it. Well, he's Uh, Jerry Jerry, uh, Jerry Maguire. Yeah. He was in Jerry Maguire. I think he was in Curb Your Enthusiasm. He's been in a bunch of stuff. Yeah, you you know him. Anybody listening, he's been in, in tons of movies. Yeah, but he was just a kid, and it was basically, it was done in Toronto, and it's about this kid who, he has a mad scientist who lives next door, and he bumbles into the scientist's lab one day, and he gets zapped by this photonic beam that suddenly gives him, like, super, uh, no, he's got invulnerability, super strength, and he can kind of fly, because that's one of the gimmicks, he can actually only levitate. Yeah, he so floats. He has to, what? <laughs> he floats. He floats, yeah. basically. So he has to use, like, he figures out pretty quickly he can use aerosol cans, to like, I mean, he sprays them like if he's in zero G because he's effectively zero grab weightless, right? So mm-hmm. he uses different tricks to actually move around, which they had just enough effects and budgets and that, that they could pull this off. Yeah. And so they did. And it ran for three seasons. It was actually pretty good. It was fairly popular. Again, he doesn't have an actual 
uh, costume or anything like that. I don't think he ever fights any supervillains. No, but... he does have a name. He calls himself, didn't he call himself Ultraman? He calls himself Ultraman. In fact, yeah. the first season, he refers to himself as Ultraman. And then after that, the second season, they changed the lyric in the opening lyric to I'm your man instead of Ultraman. Because okay. I think maybe there were some lawsuits involved or something. I'm not quite sure. Mm-hmm. For our research, I was actually looking it up because I thought of my secret identity earlier. And apparently in other languages, like it was shown in German and French and Spanish and all these other, most of them actually call it like Ultraman, your buddy or something like that. They call it your buddy Ultraman or something. It's actually, right. it's literally Ultraman is in the name. Huh. But for some reason in North America, it's just called My Secret Identity. And I've always wondered if it's because, you know, Ultraman was already a thing. I mean, Ultraman, for example, was airing in the, it aired in the 60s and they brought it back in syndication in the 80s, actually. Mm-hmm. So a lot of 80s children got to watch Ultraman, like Dawn, for example. What was 70s it? 70s and 80s. Because remember too that around this time they were gearing up to uh, do the uh, the new series Ultraman Powered. Yeah, there was that too. So maybe they maybe they were being you know they actually fought them for, it, but whatever. Yeah. But my secret Andy is one where, but he does actually fight bad guys occasionally. So I will consider it an actual superhero series, even though it's meant mostly to be a comedy drama for the most part. But yeah, it. But at the same year in 1988. The ver- and also in syndication, a Superboy TV series premiered, a live action yeah. one that mm, only Americans would probably remember. It ran for two or three years, I think it did. Uh, it was on three, for a bit. Yeah, it was on for a bit. There were quite it, a few it episodes. It was on for a bit, and it was okay. And it was a straight. That's one thing, interesting thing. It was a straight up Superboy TV series. Yeah. They didn't have a great budget, but what they did, they did what they could. And they had and villains. He fought super villains. And he fought like a whole bunch of them. In fact, actually, if you ever see the 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 Superboy, the Superboy teen, where he's got the jacket and the glasses, and he's got like the spiked haircut and everything like that, mm-hmm. that version of Superboy is actually from the Superboy TV series, the mm-hmm. live action one. But then everyone loved that design so much they put him into the comics. Basically, that's an episode where he gets he gets turned evil by Red Kryptonite, mm-hmm. and he turns himself. That's the evil Superboy look. <laughs> but they liked I remember that because they liked it so much and then like a year or two later with the death of Superman suddenly there's the new Superboy and it's like hey that's the guy from the Superboy TV series yeah that's the evil Superboy um, and so yeah I mean so that's so there's 88 so we got My Secret Identity and Superboy popped up there I, I believe there were a few others that popped up around that type uh, there was um, was it Street Hawk I think was the one oh yes yeah, that's the super vehicle motorcycle show yeah um, there was also Super Force. Okay. Now, Super Force is the one where he's an astronaut who comes back, who discovers that after he comes back from a great mission, that like the Earth's gone to shit, or at least you know society's gone to shit. And so what he does is is that he he turns his suit, uh, his motorcycle that he's got, and his suit of powered armor that uh, is meant for it was, it's basically his astronaut suit, but it's powered armor is what it is. He weaponizes the darn thing. And goes out and starts like fighting crime and doing weird stuff with it. Um, and it lasted for like 48 episodes. 48 <laughs> half hour episodes. Yikes. It was actually designed as a companion series to Superboy. That's one of the reasons why it's called Super Force, in fact. It was done by Viacom. Mm-hmm. Um, and then here's another thing. It was meant for part of a two hour block that included a show called Lightning Force. Oh, okay. So I guess if you combine Superboy with... Light- oh, whatever. Anyway, they love Super <laughs> and they love like lightning and they oh whatever and force they love that force <laughs> business right and and so yeah he's got a, he's got like powered armor and stuff like that and he's got some buddies that help him it's actually very very similar in fact to the the current dc shows that are running like arrow and the flash mm. yeah. actually it's a lot like the flash i would argue it's a lot like the flash uh maybe just a tiny bit darker and it. Yeah, you know, it's the guy in power, but he's still he's got a team just like the Flash does back at headquarters, telling him what to do. Like it's kind of because in a lot of ways, it's the standard superhero show now. Okay, yeah. Super Force is kind of the very fir- is not the first version of that, but where we have the superhero who's backed up by his team, back, sitting back in the Bat Cave, telling him what to do. Right. And this will become a standard later on, and including right now, actually. Um, and Super Force, I think, was one of the very first shows to do this. You know where mm-hmm. you know where I think mm-hmm. that comes from. It came out in 1990. Yes, but that idea, that format, mm-hmm. I think it's just because uh, a few years earlier, everybody loved Bryce and Fiona. Bryce and Fiona. What do you mean? 
Max Headroom. Oh, yeah, you're right. That's that that's true. that was the formula because remember it was Edison Carter, and then right. Fiona was his operator, and then Bryce was the tech guy, and Murray yep. was the dude that had to cover for all of them. But that seemed to me that's the first kind of. Oh my God, you're right. Yeah, that's, that's kind of the origin of the, like the team back home directing our hero out in the field. Yeah, that but they're actual participants during the operation kind of thing. Yeah. Now, mind you, that kind of thing did exist before then. I'm positive. I remember there were some, if 70s, if not 60s shows that used that kind of format. Oh, crap. What was it? There was a spy series that did that in like the 60s or 70s. The Gemini term, Man. What? The Gemini Man. He yeah, Gemini invisible. Man. I think, you're, I think, I think yeah. that was it. Yeah, A lot of them did because remember that would be the same thing as like um, Six Million Dollar Man. But Usually he didn't have a guy back home though. Oh, no, he did because you had uh, you had Oscar, you had I forget the tech, the scientist guy that like designed him was a main guy, but they weren't active participants once the adventure started. Exactly, they basically, Oscar just showed up, sent Steve on his mission, yeah. and then maybe sent in the cavalry at the end or something. And, and then that, Rudy would give him his new gadget or something. Yeah, that would kind of be it. And that was the same thing, like say Night Rider. Night Rider had the old guy and the obligatory woman that were like back at headquarters, but. They weren't doing things once the mission started. Max Hedrum's the first time I remember that the support team were active during the excitement. Right, right. Okay, I see your point. I see your point. And no, I think it wasn't Gemini Man. There's actually another series, that I think we even talked about it once, where there are secret agents. And they have like, they're watching them all through, and there's actually a oh, rotating cast of them. Yeah. And they're, and they're, and and the guys back at headquarters are giving them directions and everything like that. Oh, I can and, I can see the opening sequence, but I don't remember what it was called. Oh my god, you mean it's from the seventies, I think. Yeah, it was early. It was this early mid seventies. It wasn't around very long, but it was it was supposed to be like the Mission Impossible thing. But the yeah, difference yeah. was they had this big clunky computer desk that they would watch. Yeah. That the, and they would pick them for their missions and, and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and there were, yeah, there were a whole bunch of different agents and things. It was kind of like, it, that, was, that was a neat premise, actually. It, it would kind of be what came around, uh, Warren Ellis would do a comic, kind of the same idea called Global Frequency, mm -hmm. where there was the main character who's like, main characters who are kind of command guys, and they have all these agents in the field. And depending on the situation, they pick different agents to go out and deal with it. And I've always thought that was a very cool idea. It's never been done exactly. Global Frequency is probably the best version of it I've seen. Yeah. And it's only like a dozen comics that they did. And uh, but and they've tried to make it a TV series a few times. Doesn't work. Has or hasn't worked. But anyway, we got to get moving on. Okay. All right. So because uh, we don't because we don't want this to be another like three hour or six hour show, <laughs> and we're already pushing up towards two hours. So and we're right. already in the 1990s, dude. And things are going to get thick and fast from here. Right. All right. So, so yeah, we got all these syndicated TV series popping up like Super Force and all these other things. So we've got TV, you know, TV superheroes coming at us left, right, and center. Plus there are other networks like Fox popping up and they're trying yeah. different things too. Yeah. Um, there was even a Fox pilot for a uh, Gen 13 series, Generation 13 series, which was very popular at that point. Yeah. Um, that was in 96 and it was basically their kind of mutant X thing. That was a, for one of the first attempts to do mutant teens on TV. Well, since Mythfits of Science anyway, it didn't, yeah. it only lasted a pilot though. So it didn't do that well. Um, there was a, on uh, one of the networks, I think it was USA had the Swamp Thing TV series they did for a yeah. while. If you consider Swamp Thing, a, you know, uh, an actual superhero. That's right. But also the important thing though, to mention early 1990s though, and we should bring this up. Oh, I, 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 crap, I forgot. Oh. They also brought up The Flash, yeah, which was also on Fox, if I remember right. Yeah, And there was a, the original Flash TV series in 1990, only lasted one season, was way too inspired by uh, Batman, the movie, the, yeah. the, uh, the, the Tim Burton movie for its own good. Because um, so they tried to do a Batman-esque Flash series, and it's kind of campy and weird, um, not horrible, it's not bad, it's just kind of like there yeah because i i think if you're gonna talk uh superhero tv mm -hmm. and you're gonna get to the 90s i think there's really two things there's two shows that you really have to kind of focus on okay and that would of course be mantis of no. course everyone, <laughs> everyone remembers mantis no, from 1994 i'm totally kidding Nope. Yes, yeah, I know. The two shows that had the biggest, longest-lasting impact, I think, would be Lois and Clark. 
Okay. And the you Power can Rangers. Explain that one in a second. And and the Power Rangers. I if we're talking live action, yep. then I, I would I would agree. I would I would say no. I would argue that if we're talking animated, Batman the animated series in ninety two, yep. ha- and X Men the animated series will both have huge influence on what's coming as well. Yep. Um, so, but as far as live action goes, you're right. Lois and Clark what, and Power Rangers were probably the two big live action superhero TV series of the nineties. There's really not much question of that. And um, and Power Rangers is still running today. Yeah, and the thing with those was because Lois and Clark was the first time you got actual superheroes as not superheroes right yeah they were just treating them kind of like people well not just that but the the a lot of the stories focused on the not superhero stuff right and that's something that when you get into like the 2000s that's something that becomes kind of a big deal Mm -hmm. that the superhero that's not a superhero because that's where you get smallville Right. Well, we'll get to that in a little bit. Yeah. yeah, you're right. That kind of opens up the door for the yeah the superhero who's not a superhero. You're right. Okay. And of course, Power Rangers, which of course comes from the Japanese Sentai, which we'll be doing a whole show on later on, folks. Yep. Trust me. But um, that's... I know way too much about Sentai. <laughs> yes, you do. But but that's where you get that idea that that the the the, the Sentai, the Japanese Tokusatsu comes in it makes all the money because you start seeing a lot of the other superhero stuff especially the animated stuff following Mm. that formula well i mean the sentai though is just that's the japanese formula it had been around since like the 70s i mean they'd been pumping that for a little while i mean they they tried before oh i'm not going to go into it but but basically yeah power ranger here power rangers offered something different that the kids hadn't seen at that point um, and it was a huge breakout success, which no one expected. It literally was like cr- literally out of the blue. Yeah. Um, and part of it, I think, was the fact that it was just so darn violent. Like it was these martial arts <laughs> superheroes that were just nonstop kicking ass for a half hour. Yeah. And kids of this period were just like, holy crap, look at that. Mm-hmm. And um, so it really, yeah, it, it took off in a big way. Yeah. Um, and I remember reading an interview with the Power Rangers actors, the first original ones, of course. And they were like, they didn't, they were so busy working. They had no idea how popular they were until they actually took them to the Hollywood Bowl for an event Uh and they're driving them up and they know, and they're coming up. It's like, why are there like, why are the exits on the highway to the Hollywood Bowl all blocked with, with line, with miles and miles of cars? And then when they brought, and then eventually they figured out a way to get to the Hollywood Bowl and they discover it's overloaded. And then if (laughs) I remember right, there's actually a rush on the stage. So they have to actually cancel the event and rush them. They have to rush them (laughs) off the stage and everything because they get mobbed. Right. And they're like, oh my God, what's happened? And that's the point where they begin to realize, holy crap, this show is popular. (laughs) And they tell it better than I do, obviously, because they lived it. But the whole point is, is that, yeah, it became, it. You know, giant monsters destroying cities and robots and martial arts guys. And, oh, my God, it just blew kids' minds back then. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it was done in this slightly campy style that was kind of funny. And so even older, even the parents watching it could kind of get some chuckles out of it. Because often the monsters were making slightly dirty jokes. Yeah. Which the boat works way over the heads of the kids. So it didn't matter. Mm Mm-hmm. And, um, Plus, and this is, of course, why it became the most evil thing ever and had yeah. to be censored and it became the most hated thing ever by parents for a little while there. And that, of course, guarantees popularity. It did, actually, and which is why Power Rangers has been running with a few breaks nonstop until this day from 1992. Yeah. It has basically been almost every year there's been a Power Rangers TV series in the, on the air. Yeah. Um, and that's why. I mean, and it, again, it, a lot of it's still running off that original popularity, although it's had comebacks. It's made a couple comebacks. I mean, there was the movie just earlier when, this year, I believe, which yeah. didn't do that well. But mm, then again, it's one of those things that I don't think translates that well to a big big screen. I don't think it works that well, at least not the way they've done it anyway. Yeah, because I mean, they're, they're, no, now here's like story in depth. No, no, giant robot punching guy in rubber suit. That's what we're here for. Yep, exactly. Don't kid so yourself. There's, so there's that. And going back to what I mentioned earlier, of course, there's Batman the Animated Series and X-Men, which both yeah. of which did one fairly simple thing. They said, let's do the comic books and let's yep. just animate the comic books and animate the stuff from the comic books that people like. And that's what they did. 
And surprise, they were super huge mega hits yep. in terms of animation. Batman, Batman the Animated Series was so popular at one point, Don will remember this, mm. that, they're, that they actually started airing it in prime time. Yeah. Not because the just because the kids were watching it, because they were, you know, they were, it was just super popular. Everyone loved Batman the Animated Series. It became like a kind of a watershed moment. I remember walking through, Don knows this story, I was walking through downtown <laughs> Windsor one day. Okay, and I'm walking past, you know, walking along this back street, and I'm walking past the back of this like strip club bar. Okay, and because it was a super hot like September day, I think it was September, mm-hmm. October, whatever. It's a hot day, anyway. So they had the back door of the place open, so you couldn't see the dance or anything, but you could see the bar and everything like that. And I look in, I looked in, and true story, I look in, all the TVs were turned to Batman the Animated Series. <laughs> Like the strip club bars, TVs were all on Batman the Animated Series. I'm because I'm looking, going, they're watching Batman. Holy <laughs> crap! And so it's like literally, I'm not kidding. Batman was, you know, it was just common entertainment. It was yeah. just general audience entertainment, and people liked it. It only didn't last very long in prime time, though. I yeah. mean, uh, but but it did become popular enough that it started stripping every day after school and. Yeah, it, it made a huge effect, and it set up all the superhero stuff we watch today, even like Young Justice or whatever, all the serious superhero stuff. That's all thanks to Batman the Animated Series. It yeah. really is. Because it proved to the network that, the, that a serious, straight-up animated series, can act, superhero series, can make money, basically. Yeah. And that's where it goes from there. And then we found out that basically the X-Men animated series from the 90s Mm-hmm. formed the entire current entertainment industry kind of yeah like well, we... the the animated series from the 90s helped spawn the movies yeah and then the movie and the x-men movies which were basically the first of the modern superhero movies well effectively um would eventually you know, would spawn the marvel cinematic universe once they proved that they could make money mm-hmm. and so yeah they were they were the beginning of the great superhero age of movies in a lot of ways but the x-men animated series you could argue actually helped start that i mean so did the batman movies of course they were both the movie versions and the animated series were both working hand in hand but they definitely both played a role all right so we should probably continue moving on um so let's see uh other things well Okay, yeah, I mean, there were various other 90s TV series. I mean, one could argue that Buffy the Vampire Slayer was a superhero series. Yeah. Um, I know you're like, yeah, because it's kind <laughs> of borderline. Because really, it's... Because again, she's... Yeah, she's got superpowers and stuff, but she's just really a monster fighter. It's like kind of a variant in a lot of ways. Yeah, because it runs into that problem. And the the show had the, the problem big time that... Within the setting, it's still pretty mundane. Mm, that's true. To the point that, because um, I remember you guys used to make me watch that when it was on, and I remember my, I remember my joke about, "Gee, Mitzi, we're sorry your mom blew up," and how nobody seemed to care or notice yeah. shortly thereafter, because that TV show, which became like the pinnacle of of television nerdly drama, was mm-hmm. based on this crazy, super campy like movie from the 80s which which featured a post masturbation flap um or is that fap <laughs> Pee Wee herman is like the lead vampire yep. that takes the whole fucking movie to die kind of thing yeah and then they just decided to turn that into like no let's do that but dark and gritty okay if we must but well and it was super popular but again yeah i would not really consider it a superhero series i'm I, i'm inclined not to because i don't i think it's borderline, basically. It's borderline. Yeah. I mean, say with Angel, which comes after. I mean, they're borderline. Because, again, they're mostly just guys dealing with... their supernatural drama series is what they are, basically. Yeah, like, uh, I, you could make the argument that they are. You could make the argument that they aren't. Right. Um, and they would actually... I would argue, though, for better or for worse, they did have a big effect on what's coming on later. Because I would argue the whole idea of the whole, you know, the season arc, you know, that every season has a big bad character, that pretty much is Buffy. Okay, like Buffy yeah. was one of the very first series that actually did that. That every season is like a novel, as like a book of a novel series or something. And they all had, there's always a main bad guy. Every TV series pretty much does that now. And Buffy was the very first time I remember seeing them do that, the whole season arc thing. Right. So Buffy had a huge influence on what would come later. Like TV, I don't just mean superhero. I mean, cop shows do it, sci-fi shows. Everyone does it now. Yeah. That's just the standard that every season, 
has a has a big bad character. Well, that was Buffy. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, I got to give the girl her due. Like, you know, Buffy and Joss Whedon, they were the, the first ones to do that. And when this came out, every TV series was basically just purely episodic. And yeah, there might be a few episodes that tied in. Maybe they might introduce a villain in one episode who turned up at the end of the series to help set up the cliffhanger. But that's as close as you got. You weren't getting this slowly building bad guy in the background and setting up for a big final finale that literally everyone does now. But Buffy did it first. Yeah, I think the idea of uh, of a serialized show like that was Babylon Five, and that was the selling point. But you're right, the idea that I think that the way I'd explain it, what everybody does now is where each season is basically one big episode, right? And like you say, because they'll have like the big villain, and they sort of introduce them in the background at the beginning of the season. And then you find out more and more and more, and then the confrontation is the end. So it's it's that one single story arc over a season, right? I would say Babylon Five. Uh, it's a tough call. Uh, Babylon Five does predate Buffy. Yeah, um, it does. Um, but you get into that question of, like, I would say that the way they do it is uh-huh. more like Buffy. I would say Babylon 5 might have done it first, but Buffy is the style and the way they approach it. Yeah, that's... Where they'll be... They set it up at the beginning, then there's a few episodes, then they'll go a couple... Like, they'll have a couple, like, filler episodes, and they'll do a little more, and there'll be a couple filler episodes, and they do just kind of, like... They keep overlapping and working their way along. That's the way Buffy did it. That's not the way B5 did it. No, but like I say, when when Babylon 5 came out, that was the big selling point was... Story arc! Okay, that that's great. It's a boring story arc, but yeah, it's there. Sorry, Jack. Yep. But <laughs> Hi, Jack. dig, dig. But 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 it was the, yeah, because it was the idea that that, like I say, that was the selling point of the right. show for people was that yep. it did continue. And then yeah, like I say, I think Buffy is the one that took that and turned it into the current formula, mm-hmm. where like I would say that yeah, each season is kind of a big extended episode. Yes. Okay, that's just my that's just my point is that mm-hmm. Buffy kind of set the set the the modern standard. B five might have done it first, but Buffy set the modern standard. Yeah. All right. So, um, and then we'll continue on. Uh, let's see. We go into the two thousands. That like at this point we start getting a tumble of shows. Like we're yeah. gonna start skipping a whole bunch of them because we're gonna get we're gonna get a tumble of shows. Some of which fit like Nightman. Excuse me. Some of which, which you could argue with, like the Sentinel and such. I mean, there uh, the animated stuff again com- keeps coming in waves. Um, the, pretty much from this point on, there'll almost always be a DC Batman related show on the air because Batman proved that it gets animated ratings. There'll be various Marvel shows that will come and go and other DC shows that'll come and go. There'll always be a Power Rangers. Um, 2001, we finally get Smallville. Yeah. Which is what you were talking about earlier. Because I think what you get a lot during that period is after those four shows, now you've got the formula. Mm Mm-hmm. And everybody's doing one of those shows. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. I would agree. Yep. And so even Smallville, I now you mention it, I would agree. Smallville does kind of, it does its own thing, but it kind of comes out of Lois and Clark in some ways. Yeah. I mean, as you said, they're superheroes, but they don't, but Smallville, of course, for those who aren't familiar, is of course the story of young Clark Kent before he becomes Superman. Or more precisely, young Clark Kent and young Luthor, who apparently were hanging out in Smallville for however many years. Mm -hmm. Um, And the story of how they were best friends, and eventually they become enemies and stuff like that. And every episode, young Clark fights a fights a, what they call meteor freaks because when his when his ship came down it came down with a whole bunch of like meteor fragments and mm-hmm. people humans who encounter these fragments develop, develop weird superpowers and stuff and so he ends up every episode he'll have to fight one of these guys basically or girls he has to like stop them from doing weird stuff yeah that people are driven crazy by them that's one of the other weird things too that i find um mm-hmm has kind of infected uh, superheroes in general, but like um, right. TV shows, especially that mm-hmm. you go back to like, say the bronze age, the silver age, superheroes are just nuts. Like a superhero setting. You didn't mm-hmm. want to live in Marvel, New York because there was a mad scientist under every like manhole and ali- aliens invaded once a week. But when you started getting to this era of like the TV shows and that, mm-hmm. 
and again, I think it comes out of that '90s thing. I think it might the comes out of the the Buffy thing too. They wanted to have a unifying theme, yeah. And you you didn't get a lot of just random stuff happening in the setting. It would be like, yeah, well, it's the meteor from this happened, or it would be um, what you get in like the the movies now. If it's like uh, even remotely Spider Man related, then Oscorp did it. Like yeah, that's what true. whatever it is, Oscorp did it, and it it kind of ensmallens a lot of these settings. Yeah, that's when. Well, you know what it is though, and it comes back to what I was talking about earlier. Okay, they they ensmallens it, but it's actually kind of a crutch because what they're doing is they're basically saying, you know, we um we, we can't just have people won't buy random superhero or random super powered characters popping up because they don't normally pop up yeah. so how are we going to explain them and it's like oh because there were meteors and they're like oh okay we'll do that and they do that it's actually going back to my whole point about non-suspension of disbelief people won't believe that these characters like exist even though this is a setting where superman has there's superman they're like, well, we have to have come up with a realistic reason. <laughs> I'm using air quotes here to yeah. explain why people have other people have superpowers in this setting. Um, now, in the case of Smallville, there was an extra thing though, where the meteor freaks. These meteor par- chunks were, of course, part of Krypton, so they're kryptonite. So right. a lot of the meteor freaks had powers or had ores or that that literally were kryptonite. So Clark couldn't just beat them up. Right. That was kind of a running theme where a lot of them he had to figure out ways around them. Although, again. And this is where the modern version comes from, because the producers of Superman, or sorry, Smallville, Smallville, because mm. he never ta- he never puts on the costume once in ten years. Yeah. Um, the the producers of Smallville would eventually go on to produce the modern DC shows: uh, Arrow, The Flash, Legends of Tomorrow, um, Black Lightning's coming out. They're the same guys, okay? Right. And Smallville eventually sets the standard for those shows. It, it teaches them not only how to do with the suit special effects and how to set up the drama and everything. But the idea right from the beginning that you have Clark and then he has a whole team of like other people helping him. Right. And he's got this backup, which again kind of comes out of Buffy. That comes out of Buffy too, I yeah. will admit. That Buffy's kind of, Buffy's helped to produce that as we talked about. That's not, uh, which going back to what the other shows we were talking about as well. But this is also what sets that standard where there's always the, the, the nerdy girl, the uh, smart guy. And then there'll be one other weird guy. Yeah. And those are the team which support every single superhero now ever. Like, yeah. That's every single. And the, half the drama is about them. And half the drama is about, you know, the superhero character dealing with whoever it is that week. Right. And that's every superhero show now, period. Yeah. And Smallville kind of helps enshrine that in a lot of ways. Buffy had already done it. I agree, but I'd say Smallville had a huge influence on that too. Mostly because the, all the producers and people who worked on Smallville are all the ones producing the TV shows now. Yeah, yeah. Like they, they, they hit upon the perfect formula for doing superhero shows. And that's what we're seeing right now hmm. play out on, on the WB or whatever it's called this week. Right. <laughs> um, anyway, so superhero TV superheroes would continue on. Yeah. Uh, Smallville would run during the 2000s. Oddly enough, there's not a lot of other shows. Like there are a few Power Rangers is running. There was attempted a Blade. There was attempted. There was Heroes. We should probably mention Heroes while we're at it. Okay. Because Heroes was the one that brought in the whole idea. They brought in the whole um, big mystery. You know, uh, where we have a big cast of characters that are scattered around and they're all connected by some big mysterious thing. Yeah. And the, it, it's it, it, and half of them are assholes. More than half <laughs> actually are assholes. Right. And Heroes was an attempt to do that kind of thing. And again, they're, they wear no costumes. They're all realistic superheroes because you keep seeing that pop up again and again. Yeah. Because, again, North Americans love costume superheroes, but they don't seem to like them that much. Like, even, even if you look at the Marvel movies, I would argue, they downplay the costumes as much as they possibly can get away with. Yeah, I think some of that, though, is uh, producer anxiety. I think a lot of it is, yeah. That I think a lot of time, because there's, I, I don't want to make the reference now, but there's a really good reference somebody made, mm-hmm. but it's a show, it's it's a current show, we're not quite there yet, but it's okay. going to come back. Mm-hmm. But it's that idea that, yeah, the executives and the producers don't seem to think people can handle, you know, like weird costumes and that. 
Yep. They're they're too self conscious. Yeah, they're and too they're they're afraid to actually take that extra step. And they were anyway. Yeah, and and then there's also the idea of uh, like like the story. The thing with heroes is they wanted to have like your Marvel or DC universe where there's a bunch of different people with weird abilities wandering around, Mm -hmm. but they don't want that randomness. So they're trying like the big mystery of what's really going on. And why do we have our powers and that they're trying to unify that into one concept. Yep. Which as we already said before, tends to make the world really small. It does. There's a term for it though. I can't remember, but that I smalling. Yeah, I, I use in small inning because it's a it's an anti Simpsons reference, yeah. and and all the wisdom of the modern era is contained in the Simpsons. But so, but there's an actual term for when you're producing like a show and you try to bind everything around that one concept. Right, I'm not sure the term you're referring to. I I understand. I'm just yeah. not quite sure the term you're referring to. Um, I'm sure someone is in the audience is like shouting it right now, but unfortunately yeah. we can't hear it guys. Sorry. No, no. What was that? Wait, wait. Oh no, <laughs> sorry. I can't hear it. All right. So, and heroes has that heroes is also another amusing one where they, they did a first season, but they didn't actually expect to ever do more than a first season. So they put, they, they, they just put it all into their first season <laughs> and they're like, what we got renewed. Oh crap. Yeah. And so they didn't know what to do, how to follow it up. And so it fell apart yeah. very, very quickly. Also they had a writer's strike occur around this time, which didn't help. Yeah. Um, Super and Heroes was, if I remember, was God massively popular. Like people were crazy for Heroes for a while there. I mean, everyone was wondering and saying, like, "Save the cheerleader, save the world," which was some phrase that came from Heroes. I actually never watched more than the first episode because I looked at it and thought, "Eh, boring, pretentious." Nope, not my taste, and wandered off. Yeah. Um, so, but, and I don't regret that. No, at there, all. There were a bunch of like live action shows from that era that it was the idea of. Um... Mm-hmm. That idea of the, the, the overarching mystery. Oh, yeah, that comes from Lost. Yeah. But there was yeah, a... Lost was the one which also people lost their minds for back in about 2004, 2005, whenever it came out. Yeah, the over you get you put a bunch of characters in a place and there's an overarching mystery and there's all these different angles and flashbacks and side stories, all this weird stuff that's all around this one mystery. Well, Heroes was just piggybacking on that. Yeah. Everyone loves Lost, so let's do more of that. Yeah, and there were there were a few shows like that, and the problem yeah, there were. the problem that they all ran into was that you can keep people watching for like a season or two, mm. but if you're not giving them anything solid, they'll wander away. Sort of. Lost managed to hold their attention, or should I say keep conning them, for about <laughs> uh, four or five seasons, and then people are like, oh, okay, that's enough. And then, and then it eventually just, you know, it died. Well, it um, it it yeah. did, but it, if I remember, like lost the audience would kind of come and go, right? Well, because the audience kept hoping, like kind of like an abused partner, they kept hoping <laughs> that the you know they finally get what they thought they were getting at the beginning, uh huh. And then, from what I know, they didn't. It actually just kind of literally just it's just a freaking mess at the end. Uh, here and another show that did this is the the reboot of Battlestar Galactica did this as well. Yeah. They copied Lost Formula too. Down to it, including down to the nonsensical ending. <laughs> they they copied it, and again, people for in the two in the two thousands, whatever the aughts, basically, they love this stuff. They really yeah. did. They loved the whole, you know, the mystery. Everything's wrapped up in a mystery thing. The old major mystery. Ooh, and yeah. but the problem is, none of these shows, and it's been literally proven, none of these shows, the producers had anything past their first season planned. Yeah, they were all basically con games. Hundred percent. They were all just <laughs> the producer guys. Those who are living in denial, I'm sorry. They were conning you. And if you go back and you look at interviews with the producers of Heroes and Battlestar Galactica and Lost, they'll go, "Yeah, we had no idea what we were doing." See, the Yet only... they would constantly tell you that they did. They were bullshitting you while it was on the air. Yeah. The only thing is, I'm not entirely like opposed to that. I'm opposed to the fact that they claim they had an ending when they didn't. Ah, uh, no. Entertainment. The entertainment industry is full of shit. To begin with, okay, there's a, there's a, okay, fair enough. <laughs> but what the thing with these shows was, I always compare them to probably like one of the earliest and best was the original Prisoner. Mm-hmm. And the thing with the Prisoner was, you had this overarching thing. You, he, mm-hmm. you didn't know where the village was. You didn't know who number one was. Right. But every episode gave you something because at the end of the episode, either the village or number six won. Yes. Mm-hmm. That you got some kind of resolution, even though the mystery went on. And the problem with all of these shows, 
they were all just that mystery. And I think where people would start losing interest is you wouldn't know how to take things because you never got kind of a resolution to anything, even the smallest thing. You just Mm. couldn't, I'm going to have a hot dog. You would never find out if that guy had that hot dog, like something. And they would just drag everything out. And that's where you lose people. And you start thinking, these guys don't have a fucking clue because you're not getting any sense of progress. You're just kind of stuff is happening, but it never really ends up anywhere. It just happens. Well, because they don't know where it's going. So it, it never does go anywhere. Yeah. But you can, you can fake that for a while. It's just, I think a lot of the. Well, they did, but they didn't, because I don't think a lot of them realize you've got to give the audience a little something. Hmm. And that was where they'd start losing. And you'd see they do, like, advertise these episodes. This episode, find out if Bob has that hot dog. And then the audience would come back because you'd tease that. And then you'd have the problem that you still wouldn't find out if Bob had that hot dog. They'd play it out that you're building up to that. And just as he's about to bite it, the phone would ring and he'd put it down and wander off screen. He'd hear a scream and then close up on the hot dog, dramatic music preview for next episode has nothing to do with this. And it would just go on. And you're like, what about the fucking hot? Just give me the hot dog. Just give me the hot dog and I'll be happy and watch your stupid show. Yep. Hmm. Yep. Okay. Well, there we go. <coughs> anyway, so um, so yeah, the aughts were basically yeah these con- these shows wrapped up in a mystery, including the heroes, which was the superhero one. Um, yeah. So we had superhero drama with Smallville, and we had you know and we had that with heroes for a little while anyway. Yeah. Now, what would eventually happen, of course, is okay. Let's let's keep going on. We would eventually get to the modern era. Now, again, as things are going on, two things are happening, mm-hmm. especially once we get to the late aughts so we're getting around 20 2006 2007 2008 eventually you know iron man debuts so suddenly live action superheroes become in vogue again yes yeah. as smallville is discovering every season of smallville has progressively better special effects because duh they're getting rapidly cheaper because computer effects are getting cheaper and cheaper and they're developing new techniques and everything yeah so they're looking better and better and so it's this weird synergy by the time we get to the teens we'll call them the teens um Mm. we get to an actual point where not only do people want live action superheroes but tv shows can actually do them on a decent budget now yeah and they can do decent costumes and everything and it's totally doable you can do all sorts of things with them and they don't have to look crappy they don't have to look campy they might not look quite as good as their movie counterparts but considering they're working with literally one one hundredth of the budget i think we can forgive them um (laughs) And so, and it's amazing what they can do for one one hundredth of the budget as well. Yeah. And so, finally, we start getting into actual, you know, actual superhero shows that look like superhero shows. Um, Smallville finishes, and they're like, "Well, what do we do next?" Well, they decide because Green Arrow was super popular on Smallville, so they decide to do an Arrow T- Green Arrow TV series, which isn't connected with Smallville, different universe, different actors, whatever. Yeah. And they do Arrow, and people love it. And everyone's like, wow, people love live action superheroes. Okay, let's start doing more of that. Mm-hmm. And so we get Arrow. We Then we get, in 2013, we get Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Yeah. Um, and then 2014, we get The Flash and uh, more Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and Gotham. And it's just kind of progressed. Right, and right now, we're looking at, let's see, it just in 2015, we got Agent Carter, Agents mm-hmm. of S.H.I.E.L.D., Arrow, Daredevil, The Flash, Gotham. A Heroes Reborn, which died quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, Powers, which was done for cable, which so no one ever saw it. Yeah. Uh, Supergirl popped up. Yeah. I mean, we're get we're getting all these stuff. Plus, we're getting movie tie-in animated series. Every Marvel movie has its own animated series, pretty much at this point, uh, or at least many of them do. And um, yeah. So yeah, we've reached this final point, and it took like what? We're talking, so we, 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 let's see, 50, we're talking 67 <laughs> years, but we finally have gone from the original Superman TV series, yeah. which was actually not bad for its day. They did a decent job with it to our modern superheroes, which are not really yeah. that different, but are look a lot better anyway. And, uh, and there, but all the modern superhero shows again, cause they're produced by the same people all follow the exact same formula. I, I shouldn't say all of them. If we count the Netflix stuff like Daredevil, they actually are using a slightly different setup. They are a little more straight up superhero kind of, but again, they're doing that thing where they're trying to make them as realistic as possible. Like we've still got this situation. Yeah. Where you're just not willing to kind of let it go. 
they're not willing to actually and i guess at the po- at this point i don't blame them because i'm not sure the audience would accept it anymore now now this gets to what i was saying before i wanted to mention something that that kind of ties in because I think one of the reasons you're seeing so much superhero TV is the movies have shown the executives that the people will accept this. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the people don't feel because like the Avengers made all the money at the theater. So people feel it must be okay to watch it then. And they'll watch Yep, yep. because there's, there's one show Mm -hmm. in particular that I think it's, it's, it's popular. It's kind of, kind of a B list show overall, I guess, but it's, it's up there fairly popular. Mm Mm-hmm. That I think shows that idea of the the over the top old school crazy superhero world thing would go over mm-hmm. is out there, and I think that would be One Punch Man. Okay, but we're going back to the Japanese stuff at that point and the animated stuff. I we mean, we people people have been accepting. Okay, just to, just want to pause here. We have okay. actually since like the aughts, we have had lots of really great straight up animated superhero stuff. Like there was Young Justice was awesome. We've uh, had uh, the Avengers: Earth's Mightiest Heroes. The previous Avengers yeah. series was was really awesome. There's been some great Justice League stuff. We've had some really good animated superhero stuff that's mm-hmm. come out. And but okay, One Punch Man. Okay. Which which did super well. People have loved it. Every like everyone's yeah. crazy for One Punch Man. I agree. Okay, continue. Because that's where I say I think what 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 you're seeing because because it's not looked at as a cartoon by most people probably because it's far too gruesome and disturbing for for kids. True. But it's it's that idea that it shows a world like One Punch Man is what the Marvel universe should look like. Kind of. Because because yeah. properly, if you like, or the DC Universe, any of them, supposedly there's all kinds of different groups always doing stuff. Mm-hmm. So like Marvel New York, there there's like, what, 5,000 heroes in, in Marvel New York? Apparently there are, yes. So you should be like tripping over villain plots and stuff if you're like that. Nobody should live there anymore because the insurance premiums are way too high. But damage control will offer you cut rates, which is right. one of the reasons I love them. Right. But it's it's that idea, like I said, with One Punch Man, things just kind of come out of nowhere, and it's sort of, people are using, oh, aliens today, okay, that's horrifying, I'm going to be late for work, yesterday it was like sewer mutants, but okay, we'll get there. (laughs) Exactly, yeah, that's true. And it's... And it's the idea that that show does have, it's not like one of the most popular shows, but it does seem to have a fairly sizable general following. Well, it's an awesome show. I I wouldn't argue, Mm -hmm. I love One Punch Man. And it's it's that idea of of um, of uh, would the audience accept the more crazy superhero stuff? I'm reminded of the uh, Bill Burr's description of it. Okay, and that was the quote that I thought of. Or you just do what I do: get high and watch a bald dude punch half a crab till it explodes. <laughs> but I think, and I think that line is brilliant because I think one of the reasons people enjoy stuff like that is they do want to see the craziness. Hmm. Okay, that that's true. I I think you're right. I think they do. People people want novelty and spectacle, mm-hmm. and they're willing to actually go. They like they'd like the novelty, but the truth is, I think it goes back to that whole thing. I think producers are just terrified to try it. Yeah, um, and they it's just that whole risk adverseness, and it goes back to the whole Marvel DC movie thing, which people often comment on, which is like, you know, Marvel is like balls out. Let's 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 do the Marvel universe. Ooh, mm-hmm. that's awesome. And DC, on the other hand, is, oh, this person has superpowers. We're sorry. We're sorry. This person has powers in a costume. We're so sorry. And they just, they, they're just, they're, they're just constantly embarrassed by it. That's the way oh, yeah. they come across. The, the DC thing is, you should watch because maybe Batman will be in it. Okay. Yeah, there's that too. Yeah. <laughs> Could be a reference uh, to Batman, we promise. Yeah, like, like, hell, DC, just, just do an Angel O'Day and Sam Simeon TV show and be done with it. Well, that would be nice. Do, just do, do Prez. Right. Holy shit. If you wanted to do a Prez TV show, do it as one of those like um, like tween or young teen kind of like action comedy things. Mm-hmm. Holy shit. Would that, I think in today's political climate, would a show like that go over with young people who are just vaguely politically aware and not completely jaded yet? I would agree. The idea I, I, of I, I press series would be very interesting. 
like yeah yeah ho- holy crap well, that that but and and just oh just they should do that like and and mm-hmm. batman never shows up and we don't mention batman and batman has nothing to do with it that would be great but yeah it's like you say like dc really does seem more afraid they are i mean but there's there's the great irony though is that mm-hmm. if you that's in the theater if we're talking on tv it's the exact opposite the marvel shows are very timid for the most part and and trying really hard to be realistic and darked up and everything even agents of shield is is try sometimes too hard to be more quote unquote realistic right whereas the dc ones are like you want to see king shark no problem so we have the <laughs> flash fight, 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 fight a giant shark man and things like that and it's totally cool and it's totally awesome and everyone's okay with it the flash goes to Grizzle, gorilla city and fights gorilla grod in a gladiatorial pit surrounded by giant monkey men and stuff like that that's mm-hmm. awesome and they do it live action and they're they're unapologetic and they're right into it. And they're already halfway there because Gorilla Grodd is Sam Simeon's uncle. So you're... Well, there we go. So they could easily have Sam Simeon and Angel O'Day pop up on the Flash anytime they wanted to. Mm-hmm. They could totally should do that. And then the irony with that, though, is when you get to the animated stuff, Marvel is much, much more crazy and freewheeling and DC is much more uptight and, and yep. stodgy, about, which is weird, too. But Well, yes, you know, it's one of those things, right? Same company, different departments. Yeah. Got different people in charge who are going to take different risks and try different things. And so the end result is different. Like the different... Yeah, it's it's so weird. It's so incredibly mm. weird how <laughs> they're all different from each other. I mean, but now, you know, The Flash and Friends, I'll give them points. They've absolutely proven you can do as much live action superhero as you want. When yeah. you could, They could do a live action One Punch Man if they wanted to. I think it would be a little prohibitively expensive for television. <laughs> you could probably do it if you really wanted to. Um, right. And, I mean, Lord knows. Actually, there's right now, they just started a live-action Tick series, um, which is coming again. Out through the... Again, I know. But th- I've seen little clips of it. It came out through Amazon, I think. Uh, there uh-huh. Because they were airing it free. I didn't bother. I was never a Tick fan. I'm sorry, people. I just was never a Tick fan. Um, but what I've seen, but I did watch the original live action one. I mean, there was the comic, then there was an animated one. There was also a live action one back in the nineties. Mm-hmm. Um, this one, I can't quite put my finger on it. It actually looks a little bit like the tick crossed with one punch man. Oh, okay. Um, by which I mean, they're not shying away. It's not done like a sitcom. These characters actually do have superpowers. Like the tick actually is a superpowered character. He's not just right. a guy in a tick costume. He actually has proper proper tick level superpowers from the comic and everything. And the huh. characters actually do superhero stuff. It's Weird. not just characters who are in superhero costumes whining, which is what the <laughs> live action previous live action one was. Yeah. So it's more like the animated yeah. one where the characters actually do do superhero stuff. And it looks like the tick T V series. I don't even know where to call it T V, you know, it's a stream web series, whatever. Um, is like that. And right. so I do have to wonder, well, I haven't watched it, but now that I talk about it, maybe I will go take a look. Because it does seem like they're actually at least trying some different things. And that's that's one of the other nice things about our new golden age of television, right? Now we have these streaming services that are all competing to produce new content, just like when there was the, the uh, syndication market opened up. Right. And so a lot of them are trying different weird things, including superhero series. And uh, there's actually going to be next year a live action Teen Titans series. Yeah, I've seen that because the internet's already whining about the casting choices. Well, yeah, but but it's again, it's only for the DC streaming network. Yeah, so you have to be a subscription to DC Direct or whatever to get access to it, and that's how they're going to convince people to sign up. Which means it's doomed, but um, they might get a season or two out of it before it dies, and then it'll eventually end up on Netflix when the DC network collapses. But whatever. Yeah. Anyway, the point is, is that. So they're trying stuff like that. So whenever there's this like new going on and people are going to throwing money around experimentally, I've noticed we get new booms of like superhero stuff. Yeah. And for better, for worse, who knows, but we're going to see more of it. I think we'll continue right. to see it because people watch. Yeah. It just took 67 years for them to prove <laughs> that they, that they can do another hit series, just like freaking Superman, which was a super right. mega hit and everyone loved it, but it took them 67 years to actually do more like it. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Although, again, the original Superman series was really just a mystery series with Superman. But yeah. Mm, well, because kind of. yeah, what they need to save the day now: Skull the Slayer live action. That would be entertaining. Yep. 
Yep, spell the Slayer. That could that could totally work. Or <laughs> a game live action One Punch Man. I'd be okay with that. See, I don't think I'd like that because I think the animated one is perfectly fine. I think it is too. And in yeah. fact, I can't wait. Second season is due out relatively soon. I think maybe oh, cool. before the end of the year or beginning of next year. One of the two, anyway. Which which it's due out within the next six months. They're releasing the next season, which will be fun. I've been reading mm. the comics. Boy, is that going to be fun. Um, <laughs> anyway, so. Uh, on that note, um, I think we know what the future of you know superhero live action stuff is. More of it. I mean, I don't think there's any <laughs> doubt of that. Hopefully, yeah. they will continue to do stuff that's actually good. We'll see what happens. And um, any final thoughts on live action superheroes before we go, Don? I think what we're gonna see that we're, we we've already had little flashes of, like we said at the beginning, it could be difficult to peg down exactly what a superhero story is. Hmm, true. And I think we're getting into that point where you're going to see them start kind of pushing what counts as a superhero and what isn't. And I think that might be nice because we'll get some completely new stuff because they'll be trying new subgenres in that. Which, because they're running out of the main dudes. So eventually yeah. you can't just keep doing Batman. You have to try something new. I'm telling you, Sam Simeon and Angel O'Day. Everybody likes monkeys. Everybody likes Angel and the Ape. That is yeah. true. <laughs> yeah. Well, eventually I suspect we'll see that you're correct, sir. Mm -hmm. On that note, everyone, thanks for listening. <laughs> Hope you found this entertaining and interesting. And uh, we'll see you next show for something <laughs> equally fascinating. It'll be awesome, I promise. Just show up, okay? Please, <laughs> please listen. Oh, God, please listen. Really, you'll find out about the hot dog. Don, stop teasing them. <laughs> Good night, folks. Thanks for listening to the show. If you'd like to hear more or join the conversation, come visit us at ObeyTheDNA.com. You can also find us on iTunes or whatever fine podcast site forgot to lock their back door. So until next time, remember that to master the nerdly arts takes time, practice, and enough Coca-Cola to drop a rhino. See ya! Come on over and join the conversation at ObeyTheDNA.com, where you will find show notes and more.